So I'm going to record and we're off. Okay. Okay. Are the can you see the screen that says "Growing Fabulous Bubble Films"? We can. Okay, you're welcome to leave yourself off mute. You can speak if you have questions. Feel free to call them out. Uh, I'd be glad to uh, answer any of them that uh, I possibly can. So uh, let me start by saying real quick, if you're just getting into orchids, it's the neatest hobby that you'll ever have and it'll last you your whole life. I've been doing it for 50 years and it's more interesting now than ever. They're still finding new stuff out in the wild. The hybrids that they're making are fantastic. They're, they're getting better and better quality plants. You just heard about how fabulous the sarcochylus are. The bubble films are fantastic. There's all sorts of stuff. So it, whatever conditions you've got, whether it's hot or cold or wet or dry or bright or whatever, you can find orchids that will grow well under those conditions. So it's really neat to be able to get into this as a hobby because it's so long lasting and ongoing. And uh, don't be discouraged if you're trying, for instance, you guys live in San Francisco. It's not the best place to grow Vandas. So if you're having a hard time growing Vandas in San Francisco, give yourself a break and grow something that's more acclimated to the environment that you've got. So anyway, with that, it's wonderful to have uh, you all here tonight and we're gonna learn all about bulbophyllums and a bunch of other stuff too. So first thing we're gonna learn how to pronounce it, it's two L's, so it's bulbophyllum, not bulbophyllum. So that'll give you an exercise when you're stuck at home and you don't have anywhere to go and nothing to do, you can exercise your mind by saying bulbophyllum, not phylum. And it's the largest genus in the orchid family and the orchid family is the largest family of flowering plants in the world. I used to think it was the largest period, but somebody reminded me that there were millions of mosses and ferns and algae and things. So the family of non-flowering plants is much larger. But in flowering plants, the most flowering plants is orchids. And in orchids, the most number of orchids is bulbophyllums. And the reason that they're bulbophyllums is that if you have these characteristics, one joint in the pseudobulb, whereas a Cattleya has many joints, Dendrobiums can have 20, a Vanda has a joint where every leaf axle is. So it's got to have one joint in the bulb. It's got a flower from the bottom of the bulb or along the rhizome. And this is a very bad mistake and it's too late to fix it because Bulbophyllum lobbyi flowers like this and Bulbophyllum Rothschildianum flowers from the base of the bulb. And those are both called Bulbophyllums and they shouldn't be because flowering from the stem or from the rhizome is completely different than flowering from the bottom of the bulb. And the plants require different things. They grow differently. They can't be cut up. These kinds like lobbyi that you're seeing in this picture here need to grow into big plants before they will bloom or they won't flower, but they're very rangy, as you can see. So in no time at all, they outgrow their container. You chop them up into small pieces and they're not big enough to flower. So they're different kinds. There's like maybe 30 different genera that are all crammed into bubble films, which is why it's so large. But I'm not gonna be the one that splits them up. I'm not gonna be the one that says, you need to change the names. I'm just gonna be the one that says, this kind is different than that kind. Thirdly, and most importantly, the lip must be mobile. And if I can get lucky here, we'll do this. Some of the Zoom things. All right, this will work. This is a bulbophyllum bicolor. And that's what the lips have to do. If you have a plant that has one joint in the pseudobulb, flowers from the bottom or along the rhizome, and has a rocking lip like that, it's a bulbophyllum. Now, I'm out in the woods one day. Let's go back to here. I'm out in the woods one day. I'm driving down the road. I'm in Malaysia. Doesn't matter. I'm just, I'm someplace 
where it, it's foggier than I've ever seen it before. In fact, we have to stop driving because you can't see and you don't want to run into something. So we pulled off the side of the road and I've taken a picture that looks like this. That's a pea soup fog like you would, they talk about in London fog where the three feet away as the guy walks away, he disappears into the fog. That's how foggy it was. But this was way back when we used to do a thing called take slides where you bought film and took it with you on your trips, unlike digital pictures nowadays. So you, when you used to take slides, you would take pictures and you would come home and give the film to the store and they would give you back little squares and you'd look at them. And the square comes back and it looks like this because rain and fog don't show up on film like they do in your eyeballs, which is why they have fake rain in the movies. Not only because we need it to rain right now, but because it doesn't show up. The previous picture was what it looked like to my eye. This is what the camera picked up. This is where bulba films grow. Everything that you're gonna buy that doesn't come from Madagascar grows in an area that looks like this. And this is how wet the atmosphere is. This is where they grow. And there's a secret to growing bulba films. And as you heard earlier, I have more awards for bulba films than anybody in the world. I mean, for those of you who have gotten an award of culture, you know how fantastic it is and you know how great you felt when you got it. Now imagine getting 10 cultural awards or 50 cultural awards. And now you know why I'm so proud of our 105. And I know that it's more than anyone in the world because I got an email from Bob Fuchs saying, prove it. And I actually did because I have a list of them going back to 1978 when I got my first one for a bulb of film. And anything I can do, you can do better. <laughs> Did I hear a question? Okay, there's a secret to growing bulbos, and there is, here it is, more water. But it's not just any old more water, it's more water longer. Three words to the secrets of growing bulbo films. Say it with me, more water longer. Say it again. More water, longer. longer. And that's it. Thank you very much. Let's go to the refreshments. <laughs> okay, I bet you haven't gotten your money's worth out of me, so I got a little bit more for you here. This is my growing area in the greenhouse. I didn't move the plants into this to take the picture. That's where they grow. I can grow plants that close together because I do something that you may not be doing and that is that I use these kind of things. See, I can get my plants all the way up to the edge of the table. And what happens is if you don't have a lip on the edge of your table, when you walk by a plant, you knock it over. Then you pick it up and put it back on the table and knock it over again. When you pick it back up, you push it back away from the edge like this clay pot here. And you lose two or three inches on the edge of all your growing areas because you don't want to knock stuff over. So you can get these are behind every garden center out there, uh, Lowe's, Home Depot, and the private garden centers. They're almost always free. Sometimes you have to pay a little bit of money to get somebody to part with these super heavy duty ones, but most all the rest of them, they want to get rid of them. So they're free. I cut them up with a hacksaw because it's my own happy little world and I can do anything I want. And anything I can do, you can do better. This allows you to put your plants in a position where they're not next to each other, but they're not going to fall over when you water them and you want to water thoroughly and you're going to water from all sides. We're going to have a test at the end of this talk. And if you don't pass the test, you're not going to get any of the plants at the end of the talk that are going to be available. So this one of the questions is, do you water one side or all sides? And the answer is all sides. And if you can't water all sides, water twice. And that's not 
the plant on the left, plant on the right, plant on the left, plant on the right. That's starting at the beginning of your orchid collection and watering all the way to the end and then coming back to the beginning and starting again. If you water from two different sides, that will do the same thing. But watering twice, one and one is five when it comes to watering plants. And anything I can do, you can do better. And if you think that these aren't available, look at that picture and you see the two little circles that are in the center right there. There's one and there's the other one. That's where the little plastic hanger hooked on it when it held the petunias. It was a little nine pack of garden plants for you know $3.50 or something at Home Depot. I brought it back after I finished taking the plants out of it and planting them in the bed. I use this to keep my plants and anything I can do, you can do better. So here are two plants, identical age. They're both in three inch pots. They both went into three inch pots at the same time. The one on the left is considerably bigger than the one on the right. And the reason is because it's sitting in a shallow tray. And I wanna emphasize shallow tray. <laughs> one quarter inch is fabulous. One inch is fatal. And they tell you, don't set the plants in water. What they're telling you is don't drown them in water. There's a big difference between sipping a straw and shoving your head underwater. So anyway, that little tiny uh, shallow tray at the bottom makes that plant twice the size of the other plants. That's how you get more water longer. Here's a bubble phyllum that's very easy to grow, but nobody can flower it or almost nobody can flower it because it requires more water than they get. It has a flower that looks fabulous, but hardly anybody can flower it because it requires more water than you can give it. But if you notice, it's sitting in a little shallow tray. That's a five inch bulb pan, which is a shallow pan. And the, sh and the little container that it's in is a cottage cheese lid. <laughs> We have Publix out here. This is the standard Publix store. This is down at your grocery store. These are the lids on all of the stuff that you could buy. They're all shallow. Even the ice cream one in the upper left is only uh, a little edge to it. And even though it's cardboard and it lasts for six weeks, as soon as it gets nasty, I have to throw it away. And of course I have to go buy some more ice cream because I need the lid. That's what I say is I buy all of this stuff because I need the lids. And that lobster bisque lid that comes from Sam's uh, is just the perfect size for five inch pots. This is the deep one that you can buy at Home Depot for 79 cents for eight inch pots. It's a little saucer. That means when you water the plant, the excess water can sit there, but that is fatal all the way up to the edge. So I cut a slit in it and then algae grew on the inside of the slit and I had to make it wider so that it wouldn't allow the water to raise up any higher than it was where I wanted it. I only want shallow trays. Anything I can do, you can do better. It even works for clay pots. It works even better for clay pots because clay really sucks up the water fast. This was a tiny seedling cattleya with four flowers as a first bloom seedling. And if you look at our awards, if you check the descriptions, you'll find that most of our awards have flowers that are bigger than previous awards. Flowers are mostly water. Guess how you get bigger flowers? More water. And don't tell the judges I told you that, but they're very, they get stuck. You can argue form and color all day, but there's no arguing that 10 is more than nine or nine is not as big as 10. And I like to make it easy for them to award things. So I bring the biggest stuff possible and anything I can do, you can do better. This is a piece of tree fern fiber that I stuck in water just to see how far up it would actually wick and it wicked up one foot. It took about two weeks to do that, but it did go all the way up one foot. This has nothing to do with water, but this has to do with space. This is a five foot long piece of hardware cloth. It's two feet wide, was left over from making one of the tables that I made. 
it comes in a roll and I was going to put it on the wall. And every time I set it down, it's sproined into a circle. And I realized for you math buffs out there, a circle with a circumference of 60 inches has a diameter of what? And the answer is 19 inches, which is just a little over a foot and a half. So here is five feet of hanging space into a foot and a half plus a little on the outside where they hang. But that's a lot of plants in a small area. Bright things on top, things that want to be shadier on the bottom. The hanger that's on it is a double hanger for clay pots because it's super heavy duty wire and I've got it wired to that so that I'm not heartbroken coming out in the morning and finding it on the ground. And if you want to get real fancy, up at the top, go down to Home Depot and buy some heavy duty nylon line because nylon isn't gonna rust or corrode or rot. And you tie loops in the two ends and one of the loop goes over a nail or a pile, pile uh, pole that you got. And the other one goes through that hanger. And then when you water on the right side, it'll start spinning and you can water all sides thoroughly and anything I can do, you can do better. You can use those, these are our rolling carts. The plants that are on these carts are inside the house now because it's gonna be in the low 40s tonight. We roll them out in the daytime if it's gonna get nice and warm for several days, they go back and forth. You can do anything I can do, you can do better. Here we are, these are cattleyas, as obvious. We grow lots of different kinds of things. So tonight's talk is going to be about bubble films, and what's the secret to growing bubble films that you now know three words? Water, 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 longer, water, longer. water longer. Now you know. That's all you. If you remember more water longer, you're going to know what bubble films require. Because remember how foggy it was in the air. Cactus take in water fast because it's never there. Bubble films take in water slowly because it's always there. That's how you remember more water longer. Bubble films have to be wet for a half an hour before they even start taking in water. So if you've got something that's hanging on a piece of wood vertically and you water it once or twice a week, there's a reason why it's not very big and you very rarely get flowers. So. Here's how we have 105 cultural awards and anything we do, you can do better. And that is, we have a hidden secret power. And the secret power is kind of like this. Everybody has the same muscle to wiggle their ears, but some people know how to access that muscle and I have no idea how to get to it, but I know it exists because I've seen people wiggle their ears. But we all have a secret hidden power, and that is the power of observation, or in this instance, poo. We're going to want poo. You want a highly developed sense of poo. You want your poo on high all the time. And I promise you, having a better power of observation means that you notice things around you more, and it will make every aspect of your life better way beyond having your plants grow more better. -er. You'll see everything do more better -er because you're paying attention more. Dory is a natural and I am not. I had to teach myself how to become a master grower and the master growers are the ones who have the best powers of observation and it wasn't natural for me, I had to learn. So I taught myself this way, you get 10 old pennies and you give them to somebody in this case, it was Dory, and you put them around on your plants. They're not hidden. They're not jammed down in the mix. They're not under the pots. They're just sitting around on the plants. So you have to find them. Every penny that you don't find, you owe your friend $10. And in the blink of an eye, you will see the difference between how you used to be looking and how you should be looking because it's gonna cost you 10 bucks if you can't find that penny. And here they are. Mm -hmm. 
And there's one more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And see what I would do, I'm, you're perfect. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the person in the screen next to you because he or she is not perfect, not like you. Most people focus on the spot on this leaf right here, or they notice this yellow spot on the leaf here, and they wind up overlooking the stuff in front of them. And that's how you have to train yourself to focus what we're doing, not you, you're perfect. The person next to you, what we're doing is scanning. And if anything happens to jump out at us, we think we saw it. We really have to turn from scanning to searching. And as soon as you start doing that, you up your poo factor by 10 and your life gets better and your plants start doing better. How about if you're growing paths? And one last one. Let's see if you can find those, you can find mealybugs before they become a million mealybugs. You can see the scale on the leaf. When scale first starts, it'll look like a little light area on the leaf, just like that. If, if that was scale, you could turn the leaf over and you'd find one adult scale there. If you have to wait until the entire underside of this leaf is white with scale, you haven't had your poo on. And I speak from personal experience on all of this. Okay, here's why you want to, I make my own plant food because I, I have to, you can't get the ingredients by buying them from the store. So I make my own plant food. That's one of the reasons why we have awards for culture in all these genera. In addition to that, I also use a product from Laura Newton called Plant Potion Number no. 9. It's a chelation agent. And I always thought chelation was like voodoo therapy because nobody could explain to me how it worked in a manner that I could understand until I got uh, uh, Ron McCatton drew me a diagram of a molecule and how it became uh, what it was later on and how chelation worked and here's how it works. Plants have these membranes. They're not holes where water falls in and out. It's a membrane that allows moisture to pass through it if everything's right. But everything that wants to go into the plant, it turns out that chemistry works on positive, negative, and neutral. And that's how things stick together or don't stick together. And in this instance, the iron atom has a lot of electrical charge to it. And because it has a, a big electrical charge, that causes the plant membrane to close down. That's why your food isn't getting into your orchids, even if you're giving them food, which you probably aren't anyway. So let's try this again. The same plant membrane but now you take your iron and you use a chelation agent on it. In this case, plant potion number nine, which you get from me. Laura Newton makes it, but you get it from me. That white thing around the outside is the chelation agent, which allows water to connect with iron. That's what being water soluble means is having water attached to it. And water is a fabulous substance, two gases, that you put together and they form a liquid which dissolves everything in the universe. So water is a really, really important thing. And when the plants have the stuff around it like this, then it goes into the plant and your plants grow much more better. And you have the choice of the face on the top of the screen or the face on the bottom of the screen. Anything I can do, you can do better. All I do is give my plants a little bit of food every week, which we coined the phrase weekly, weekly about 50 years ago. A small amount of food once a week is all they need. And how do you make your food go twice as far? You water first because watering and feeding are two completely different things. Watering is lush and thorough and feeding is targeted and stingy. So you water your plants thoroughly, you come back and you feed them. 
first off, you're not going to be watering them, you're feeding them. So you're gonna use half as much as you used before, probably way less than half. And the way you get your plant food to go four times as far as it was going before is you use half strength. Just a little bit of food every Saturday and you will see your plants go nuts, especially if you're using the right kind of food. So it's only got seven ingredients in it, but we couldn't think of anything with seven that we liked. So we came with plant potion number nine, like the Seeker's Tune. So anyway, this is the Waffle House growing style. I have to use things like this to help trigger my memory. I think these are called anagrams or analogs or Anna something. Anyway, this is Waffle House growing style. And it starts with W for water. And the question I'm gonna ask is, do you water all sides or one side? And the answer is all sides. And if you can't water all sides or you don't wanna water all sides, you're just a contrarian, water twice. Shallow trays, shallow trays will help you. And what's the secret to growing bulbos? More, more water, water longer and it's the longer part it's not just more water it just has to be around longer and here's what you're going to do through the talk tonight is that i'm going to be pressing you to start using your own powers of observation to tell you how often you need to water whether the plant's getting enough light or not all the questions that you want to ask you can actually answer yourself if you actually look at your plants more thoroughly. And I know you're perfect. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the person next to you. So do you water one side or all sides? All sides. Size. Do you want good airflow? Yes. Do you yes. want good airflow day and night with any kind of air because any kind of air is good? No. You want good airflow day and night with fresh and if you don't think fresh air is important, put a bag over your head and you will very quickly change your mind. <laughs> There's still stuff in the bag. It just isn't any good anymore because you've used all the good stuff out of it. I don't want to, it's, it's much more complicated than this, but let's be simple. Plants take in stuff during the day and they make stuff at night. It's, that's not exactly true, but think of it that way. They take in food and water during the day and they use that at night with fresh air to make stuff. Look at your plant in the morning and in the evening and it's not much different. The next morning, it's very different. That evening, it's not much different. The next morning, it's very different because the elves come in at night to make the shoes. <laughs> okay, how do you make your food go twice as far? Water first. How do you make your food go twice as far? Water first. How do you make it go four times as far? Half strength. Whatever it says, my label says two teaspoons per gallon full strength. And I use one teaspoon per gallon and I do it every single week. And in fact, since I'm down in Florida and we, we have long days, there's a lot of growing that goes on down here for the last up until a month or so ago, I was feeding them every five days because they're growing. Okay, this is a little bit about colchicine because some of the plants at my site cost more. The reason they cost more is that everything that I have is soaked in colchicine, which is a mutagen designed to boost up the chromosomes in the plant. Here's a picture, the picture on the right the flower on the right, that's bubble film Wilbur Chang. And the flower on the right is the adorable clone, which has an AM to it. The flower on the left of the picture, this flower here, is a tetraploid of the same cross. The flower on the right is an AM. If I ever took this flower into judging, it would be that an FCC flower. It's twice the thickness. It's bigger, thicker, richer, darker. Everything about it is different. And it's nothing that I did. It's the plant gets soaked in this stuff and it causes changes to take place. And anytime I tell the truth, 
dogs bark. Okay, it started up here and this is Beaufort, which is uh, Coccinia and Luteola. And the upper left corner is Elmwood, got an AM. They cloned it, Maricloned it in the process of Maricloning. The 4N in the upper right corner came out from Harford's, uh, the little greenhouse. And uh, it received an AM as well and was given the name Harford's Elmwood, and that's a 4N. The bottom picture, the top pictures are old AOS slides, which are losing their color. The bottom picture is our plant that we took. I took this picture last year in a three and a half inch pot. Those are fantastic flowers. So that's why I'm trying to get tetraploids. As soon as you start seeing your first tetraploids, you strive for that because uh, if would you rather have the flower on the upper right or the upper left and most everybody would want the one on the upper right which is actually the bottom flower so tetraploids are better okay here we are in the woods here they are growing this is where they occur in the wild this is called the goldilocks zone right here seeds that land up in the sun and germinate up here die because it's too sunny and they're burned. Seeds that land down here on the ground germinate and rot because it's too wet and dark. The seeds that are right in the perfect area for little tiny seedlings to grow, that's where they start growing. But because they're plants and they can't move, that's where they stay. So they grow there until the tree on the left falls over or is knocked over by a storm or something. Anyway, more light comes to the plant on the right and then it comes up into bloom. So if you are growing plants and the plants are in great shape but you're not getting flowers, the reason is you're not giving them enough light. They're getting enough food to grow but they're not getting enough light to flower. So if you're growing, do you want dark shade or bright shade? And the answer is bright shade because you won't get flowers if you don't have bright shade and you test for bright shade with your fingers. Take your hand with your fingers spread apart, a foot above the leaves of your plant in the brightest time of the day. You can't get a reading at night because you can't get an accurate reading with a flashlight. Go out in the brightest time, a foot above your leaves with your fingers spread apart and move your hand back and forth. If you can't see a shadow, that's why you never see any flowers. If you can see a shadow moving back and forth, but you can't see fingers, that's Phalaenopsis light. If you can see fingers, but they're fuzzy, that's Cattleya, Dendrobium, Oncidium, Bulbophyllum, Paphiopetalum, all of that light. If you can see sharp edges to your fingers, that's Vandalite. And very rarely will you see that. Most of the light that you'll see will be in the medium range. And you want bright shade, not dark shade. And you can tell your own, you can go buy a light meter if you want, or you can use your hand. So here's our test question. Do you want dark shade or bright shade? Bright shade. Oh, here's the thing, test for the heat. How do you tell how much is too much? And the answer is you burn a leaf because that's the only way you're gonna tell. And all of us have done it. And some of us have done it more than others. But anyway, if you wanna know, put your hand on the leaf and hold it and count to five. You, the palm of your hand is gonna be close to hundred degrees. If the leaf is hot, it's too hot. If it's cold, it's too cold. If it's cool or warm, that's fine but not hot. If it's hot, that means it's more than 104 degrees and the plant is no longer uh, growing, it is perspiring. We can't see it, but they are losing water. And you can tell they're losing water if you look for shiny leaves and you don't see a shiny leaf, that's telling you that the, that the leaf is losing water. I know, how do you do that? Here's how it's losing water. If you have a party and you blow up balloons, that night the balloons are shiny. The next morning when you come out, the balloons are, are matte. They're not shiny anymore because they've lost air. That's what happens with leaves. If the water leaving the leaf and the water entering the leaf is perfect, they're nice and shiny. 
as soon as the water level isn't right, they lose that shine. And so if you look for shiny leaves, or if you look for the lack of shiny leaves, you'll get much better results. And anything I can do, you can do better. And if you follow those tips, you'll get these results. Lobby Eye, Jersey, Doris Dukes, Mastrosianum, Adorable Candy, uh, Lobby Eye, Jersey, Adorable Anna Roth, Rothschildianum, Carunculatum. And that was just 11. Only 10 of those were cultural awards. The first picture I never took into judging because I was using it for breeding. That was Lobby Eye Kathy's Gold. Anyway, the house. It's the largest genus in the largest family of flowering plants on the surface of the earth. And you asked me what to plant them in. My answer is you need to plant them in something that will make more water longer. So if you're gonna grow, do you grow in plastic pots or clay pots? And the answer is plastic pots because clay pots dry out much faster. If you're gonna grow, uh, if you're gonna use a mix, if you like to water, your mix needs to be open so the plants can dry out faster. If you don't like to water or you don't have the ability to water, you need to use sphagnum moss or something like that that will hold water longer. I have shallow trays under lots of my plants. I like to water. So having them dry out too quickly is not a problem for me. It's a problem for other people, but not for me. My only thing about a house is I put my things on mounts. There's only one bulbophyllum that I mount, and that is frosty eye. And I mount frosty eye on cork, not tree fern fiber, because tree fern fiber lasts for years and years. The cork lasts for years as well, but here's the difference. Tree fern fiber, the roots grow into it and five years down the road, the plants, when you put plants on tree fern, they initially start doing wonderfully and you say, oh great, this is, look how wonderfully this is growing. And two years later, the plant is fabulous. And three years later, it's not quite right for some reason, and four years later, it's declining. And five years later, if it's not dead, you're taking it off this falling off piece of tree fern fiber. But what's happened has the salts from fertilizer and water have stayed in the tree fern fiber and it's become toxic to the plant. That's why they don't do well. If you think of the mount as a diaper, you can quickly imagine what happens if you don't change it for years. That's why I use cork or any kind of wood thing where the plant's growing on the outside because the uh, salts don't build up so much on the outside of stuff as they do on the inside. So anyway, just saying, if you're gonna grow on mounts, grow on cork. Now, this is bubble film Romei in situ, which means in sight. It's in the Philippines in Mindanao. Uh, I'm in the Philippines and I'm gone to go see the giant bubble film fascinator in the Philippines. And I get there and I collect the plant and bring it back and it flowers. And when it flowers, I realize it's not fascinator at all. And it turns out it hasn't been properly named. So I describe it and I name it after the chief of the Indians who took me to see the plants. And here they are growing on the tree in the woods where they come from. Here they are growing on a branch of the tree four feet away from the previous picture that you saw. And I looked at these for five years just to show you that nobody's perfect, even though I'm the best in the world and the most humble. It, fi after looking at this for five years, I realized it was showing me an exact um, perfect way to show you why you want to grow things horizontally, why you want to put mounts horizontally rather than vertically. This is up the trunk vertically. Look at the bulbs. Look how many bulbs don't have leaves on them. Look how shriveled the bulbs are. Look how the leaves are yellow green, how the leaves have spots on them. If you study this picture as I have for years, you'll see that there's only two old flower spikes in it 
and very few of the old spikes at all, and there's only two. Now, four feet away, look at the difference in the leaf structure. All the bulbs have leaves on them. The leaves are greener and richer. They're not spotted. Everything is better about the plant. And the only thing different, it's on the same tree in the same area. The only thing different is that that's horizontal where the water stays around longer. And if you notice, there is a flower right there. So the plant's actually blooming right now, whereas up the trunk, there are no flowers coming up and no buds, no flower spikes or anything. So if you're gonna grow on mounts, grow horizontally. Now, how do you pot them? Let's pretend you don't know anything at all and just start from the beginning. This is Bulbophyllum Rothschildianum. This is Stockers. That's the award slide. That's what the plant looked like five days before that, before I cut off 10 flower spikes that got old. I'm taking a picture from overhead. But anyway, here's the plants pulled out of the pot. I use top quality New Zealand or Chilean sphagnum moss. And this sphagnum moss is a couple of years old and it's still in perfect condition. So I'm gonna keep using it. You see the plant has grown outside the pot because I got a lot of plants and too much, too, too many things to do and not enough time. The styrofoam peanuts are the white stuff. That's what's here on the bottom. There's the three inch pot and so on. If you wanted, if this was old, it would come off easily, but since it's staying in this perfect condition, I can see it's still in great shape. So I'm keeping it and you can see the roots are alive and well and growing. So here it is. <clears throat> Here's a new pot. This is a six and a half inch bulb pan and those are styrofoam peanuts in the bottom. <coughs> Excuse me, there's the plant inside the pot. It's growing outside the pot in two directions. This six and a half inch pot really needs to go into an eight inch pot. But as you remember, I'm limited in how much space I've got and you may be limited too. So I am gonna put this plant into this pot, I'm gonna shove it in and hold it where I want it to. And I'm gonna do that with a plastic pot clip that I make myself and you can too. This is the wire that I use. And the gauge of this wire just happens to be exactly the same gauge as wire hangers from the uh, dry cleaners. Whenever you get wire hangers, remember the uh, Mommy Dearest movie with no wire hangers. Well, that's what you do with wire hangers is you bend the end with a little 45. And then that 45 goes under the edge of the lip of the pot and my fingers on the left side, giving myself a measurement. Then I put my pliers right here and bend it into this shape. Not this shape, there's a difference. This is uptight. This is laid back. And you guys know you don't want to be uptight. You want to be laid back. So what happens is I move the pot, fill it back up with sphagnum moss and the rhizomes of the plant, the rhizome right there and the rhizome right there are pushing up on this part of the clip, which is pushing this part under the lip. And you can, water this plant thoroughly and grab it by the bulbs right here and lift it up and it will not come out of that pot. You can't get this clip off if you put it on properly. And anything I can do, you can do better. I date my tags because I'm neurotic and so everybody needs a hobby. So there's the plant when it's done. I clean the leaves, make sure that there aren't any spots on them. I take off the leaves that have spots so that when they go back into the growing area, they're clean. That means if I see a spot out in the growing area, it's new. So it went from there to there in two minutes. It took me longer to tell you about it than it actually took to do it, but I was photographing along the way. It doesn't take long to do this at all. It's just a, an easy process. And the easier you make things to do, the faster and more often you'll do them. Okay, flowers, largest plant family in the world, largest group of the largest plant family flowering. So let's get to the flowers. One of the things 
we're going to have a cheap commercial message here. You do get 20% off uh, my site. The promo code is going to be San Francisco, spelled all the way out. Um, the uh, You don't get 20% off on the plant food and the plant potion number nine because I don't make much on it, but I do sell it, so you do get it. The best thing that you're going to get, my book, which is 60 bucks, is 20% off. And the ebook, as soon as I wrote my hardback book, everybody said, oh, this is great. You got to write another book. And I thought, well, you don't know how hard it is to write the first one. It's even harder to write the second one. So I started doing an ebook and I started back in 2016. And I walked around my growing area at least once a week. And I talked about all the stuff that I saw, the things that were in bloom, good things, bad things, problems, all sorts of stuff. I also filmed repotting all sorts of different genera and fixing problems, uh, fungus problems and insect problems and building stuff and all of that in videos. Uh, for $69 minus 20%, which winds up being, I think about $56, you get the ebook, which has been going on now for four years and it's gonna continue on for as long as I want but what you get are four years worth of articles, videos, um, uh, essays that I've written, and a photo library made by Mark Duttweiler using a process called photo stacking, which gives you pictures like this. And you can get much, much closer to the photo than I can bring you in PowerPoint. When you buy the ebook, I'll send you a, what you get is a link. And that link opens up other links to all of these folders. And in the folders of Mark Duttweiler, it's called MD2020, his folder has 1,500 pictures of our flowers over a number of years that he took. And this is what they look like. This is an osmophore at the end of that petal on that flower. And you could see if you reverse that, you could see how close you can zoom in on things. And I can go three times farther into this than I can show you here. It's just the quality of the pictures is unbelievable. The, the photo library is worth the money alone. But anyway, you get all sorts of different um, pictures of neat bubble films and other things. All the stuff that we had that was in bloom, he moved to. Uh, he used to live on the East Coast, three and a half hours away. He moved to five minutes from the house and lived here for a year and a half and then moved back because it was too expensive to live in Hillsborough County because our insurance rates are so high. So anyway, on to other stuff. Here's an 18 inch tall flower, horribly stinky, but an 18 inch tall flower. And it's odd how this flower turns out to be important. Here's a plant, which is a trios. They've put this into bubble films, but that's not. This is a trios. And you can't believe how that flower looks when you get right up into it. You're almost at the cellular level on these flowers. Enunctum, that's a three inch flower, flowers along the rhizome. This I've been told is actually geminatum, but I've always been called biflorum because when it flowers, it has two flowers hence the name biflorum. But anyway, wh what other color it is or whatever the name is, it always flowers two flowers. This is the umbel type. They come in all sorts of colors, stripes, spots, uh, presentation like this, presentation like a bell, all sorts of things. They're easy to grow. The flowers don't last very long, but they flower over and over and over. So. Uh, five inch pot size or a five inch basket will give you flowers 20 times during the year. And they can get pretty big too. This is bicolor. If your bicolors are growing, but they're not flowering, they need to be chilled off in the winter time in order to flower in May. And by chilled off, I leave them outside unless it's going to freeze. When it was 34 the other night, I brought them in because I was a little too close, but they could have stayed out. As long as it doesn't freeze, they're okay. 
But if you look at this head of flowers, most of the bicolors that you see blooming don't have eight flowers, they have three or four. Anything I can do, you can do better. Shallow trays give you more water longer. And if it's got food in it, it gives you more food longer. There's a hybrid using bicolor. See how the flowers work out? And they flower over and over like that. I'm in the Philippines, I wanna get a Macoyanum and they say, oh, here's a Macoyanum. And by the time I get over there, the guy's already run up the tree and he's collected it, the flowers inside that red circle. But this is back when I'm a drunk about 12 years ago. And I say, hey, crikey, I wanna climb the tree and get me own plant. So 30 feet up a tree, which is hanging over a cliff and you're going, well, I don't know when the last time you climbed 30 feet up a tree, but I'm, 59 years old and I'm hung over from the gin I drank the night before. I'm up in the tree and I'm saying, don't fall because you don't wanna kill yourself in the woods anywhere, let alone in the Philippines. And as soon as I get up there, look what I see farther down the branch, an even better one. And when I finally get there, what do I see up almost out of my reach is this one. And it looks different than the other ones just because the plant is more robust. I finally get it. I don't fall into the cliff and kill myself. That's the plant that I got brought back. I left the thing, all the things that I collected, I left at a nursery for a year for them to grow out and get natural growth. And then they're allowed to get CITES so that you can send them out. That's how I brought them back for people that I want to ask, how do you bring them back? That's how I did it. This was the plant that came into bloom. It's bigger than any of the others. And you can see that in the description. They talk about how much bigger. This was the plant that I kept getting whenever I wanted to buy a Macoyanum. And I would say to the person selling it, are you sure this is a Macoyanum? Cause they're bigger and neater looking. And they'd say yes, and it would bloom. And it would be what was called Lepidum or Daisy Chain, which are incorrect names. Labellum Veneris is the true name. And I know who cares, hurry up. Here we go for Medusa. This is the Max clone. That's twice the size of normal Medusas. How do you do that? More water, longer. That's sitting in a tray of water. There's the adorable clone. The adorable name comes from Doris and Bill. That's how we got that. Our clone is pink spotted. It looks pink from a distance. There's our clone of Rothschildianum. Red chimney is flat out horizontal. The adorable clone is bell-shaped. I crossed these two together and we got a population so that it went around. Instead of having only three or four clones all around the world, now people have a new set of uh, gene pool to work from because I made several crosses with these. And in fact, this is the reddest one that we've gotten so far. Okay, this is a little Dutch shoe one, frosty eye. This is called Giant's Boots. Giant's Boots got its AM with two flowers. I bet, bet if I showed it with four flowers, it would be elevated, but we know it's a beautiful flower, so we just use it. And it's growing on a cork slab. You can see it behind it. Now, that's what happens when you cross those two together. See? You cross Rothschildianum and frosty eye and you get crown point. And crown point is a neat flower and it flowers over and over again. The original cross was made by Marilyn Ledoux of Windy Hill Orchids in Labadee, Missouri. Beautiful cross. This was my plant, got a blue ribbon at the uh, uh, World Orchid Conference uh, in Miami. Okay, mean poison raspberry is a cross using bicolor and that plant, that you saw before, frosty eye, the giant's boots. You see my thumb at the top of the picture. That's a two inch pot I'm holding. So essentially this is a three inch pot. First bloom seedling, six flowers, neat cross. Anything I can do, you can do better. This is a, one of Mark Duttweiler's photos. This is adorable Colin, which is Dory's grandchild. Uh, it's Doris Dukes and uh, Echinolabia. That's a species, Denisii. That's Masterzianum. This plant is almost always in bloom. 
If it doesn't have a flower spike open, it's got flowers coming up on it. This is probably one of the best plants. If you're gonna grow one bubble phyllum, it should be Master Zeonum because it doesn't smell bad and it flowers all the time and it doesn't grow, it's not rambly. Uh, this is hard to flower unless you give it lots and lots of water as you saw, but it still has a neat flower. This is a kind of, I'm trying to show you how close you can get on the photos. This is where I found I couldn't get any closer than this without it pixelating in the uh, PowerPoint has a set uh, resolution to their pictures. So I can bring a photo over and I can crop it and bring it up and crop it and bring it up. And there's a certain point I can't get beyond in PowerPoint, but if you had the uh, Dropbox file you see the upper left hand picture, that little circle is the photo in the right. And I can do that three or four more times closer and closer like that. I just can't show it to you through PowerPoint. But anyway, it's fabulous photos. You can't believe what these flowers look like because you can't see the things that are so small. But when you get in there and look at them closely, they're really fascinating. Okay more water longer this is where your poo comes in you ask the question how often do i water how much light does this get well do i feed it all that sort of thing you have to use your own powers of observation to tell you by looking at the plant how fast it's drying out is it's drying out too fast if your plant is sitting in a shallow tray and you water it and there's a little quarter of an inch of water in a shallow tray around your plant, and two days later, the water's still there, something's wrong. It's not bright enough, there's not enough air circulation, something's wrong because the water should be gone. I have bright light and lots of air movement so my stuff can dry out. Anything I can do, you can do better. That's what you're trying to do is, the plants do best at the brightest light short of burning. They don't want to burn, but they want to be under bright light. Bright light for each plant. Bright light for fails is much lower than bright light for vandas. So it makes the difference as to what you're growing. I can't tell you from Florida, that's a different planet. You have to go to the planet San Francisco and tell where does the wind come from? Where's the sunlight? What time of day is best for the light and so on? Use your newfound powers of observation to tell you what's going on around you and how your plants are responding to what you're doing, good or bad. All right, here's Dory standing next to the biggest bubble phyllum out there. And I crossed it with the biggest bubble phyllum flower out there. And I thought I was gonna wait 20 years to see a bloom. And it turned out that using echinolabium, that flower in the lower left, makes plants bloom when they're small. Even though it's a large plant and will get fairly large, the plants start blooming. The one on the right, the first bloom seedling, is a three and a half inch pot. And as you can see, it's blooming with two flowers. There's the plant as it grew up larger, almost perfect, got an AM. That's Karen Lewis holding the plant. It's the size of a cattleya, and the flowers are the size of a cattleya. So we're there. Bubble phyllums are great. And you can do the same thing with a tiny little plant. This is the other end. This is the 18 inch flower here. This is the smallest of those long leafed guys. This one only has a foot long leaf. And you cross the two together and you get this thing that blooms in a three inch pot. I got a cultural award on one of these in a five inch pot with 13 flower spikes on it. This one was a first bloom seedling, got an FCC, and it turned out it was the highest award that year. And I had to write an essay about it for the AOS Bulletin. You couldn't fit my head through the door for a while. If you just imagine, make your own hybrid, put it in front of the most critical people in the world and have them judge it the best they saw that year. I was real happy with that. So, growth. If you want to grow bubble phyllums, do you want to grow in plastic pots or clay pots? Plastic is right. And on mounts, do you want your mounts to be vertical or horizontal? And horizontal is right. Sickness. 
problems. Can you imagine what you would get? Slugs and snails are gonna give you problems because of more water longer. Slug baits, don't use beer, it doesn't work. Slug baits are very effective. You can, it's easy to track down slugs and snails because they leave a trail behind them and you can tell where they are from that trail. Roaches are a little hard. Do you, I don't know if you have roaches in San Francisco. I heard it was heaven out there. We have roaches in Florida. So if you don't have roaches, don't worry about it. But if you have, if you get up in the morning and there are parts of your plant that are gone, you probably have roaches. Raid house and garden works great, but check your plants after the sun has gone down. Every bugs, not roaches. <laughs> Kill bugs. Did you say? No, I said I thought in Florida they called them palmetto bugs. They didn't want to call them roaches. Oh, well, <laughs> they can be. I think there are 40 something different kinds of roaches that we have here. We do have palmetto bugs, German cockroaches, cockroaches, all sorts of things. You can't, it's a veritable heaven for insects down here. But anyway, here's my favorite insecticide to use of all time, and that's neem oil. I get it from Southern Ag or Dynagro. That's 1-800-D-Y-N-A-G-R-O. I, I buy Southern Ag, which happens to be closer to me and I can get it in quartz. The reason that I use neem oil and the reason that you should use neem oil is because it kills everything that requires oxygen to live. They can't build up a resistance to it and it's beneficial to get it on you. So there's no better insecticide to use. It works by smothering them and they can't breathe their way out of that. It, it covers their spiracles, which are the little holes that the insects have to breathe. It plugs them up and they can't breathe and they die. It's uh, been used in India for 2000 years as a skin uh, fixer as a gum fixer and as a stomach fixer. So what insecticide is beneficial to drink? And if you answered neem oil, you'd be right. All of the rest of them, you're supposed to put on hat, gloves, respirator, long sleeve, and on and on and on. And we know you do that because you're perfect, but the person next to you doesn't do that. So start using neem oil. And finally, this is the surprise test question you're gonna get. When is it cool to spray chemicals? And in the planet Florida, it is only cool in the evening. You guys know your environment much better than I do. It's hot in Florida. If I got up at seven o'clock and sprayed things when it was cool, at nine o'clock it'd be 95 degrees and it would burn the plants because they don't like it. I spray in the latter part of the afternoon as the sun's going down. I'm in charge of spraying Doris Dukes and Bill Tom's private orchid collection, and I haven't hurt anything in 30 years, and I spray when it's cool. Epsom salt, this is the E part of Waffle House. Epsom salt, how much do you use? One teaspoon per gallon. How often do you use it? once a month. How do you tell when to use it? Spray it around the first of the month. Why do you want to use Epsom salts? Here's why. Chlorophyll is the green stuff that plants use to turn sunlight into sugar. That green stuff is built around an atom of magnesium. So if you are not giving magnesium to your plants, they can't make more green stuff, which is why they're not growing. And if you have mixed magnesium into something else, it's become inert, which is why they're not growing. I don't wanna to be too politically incorrect. So let's just say that, mag that magnesium is like most guys and some loose women in that they will hook up with anything next to them. And that's what happens with magnesium. And that's why you don't want to put, if I could put this into my plant food, I'd sell you one bag of stuff. I wouldn't sell you two different things. 
and I wouldn't tell you to use Epsom salts, which you can buy all by yourself and use it by itself. The plant potion number nine and my food I put together, I put magnesium by itself. I'm gonna say that again. I spray Epsom salts by itself. I spray Epsom salts by itself. And anything I can do, you can do better. Here's 10 more. Bicolor, uh, Lazy Ocylum, Icicles, um, Sue Blackmore, Cindy Dukes, Longissimum, uh, Flabellum Veneris, Emily Seagrist, Cocoenum, Emily Seagrist, Adorable 2. I got a cultural award in 2012. This is growing in a 12 inch bulb pan. I cut the hanger off so the photo would look nice and I couldn't get the hanger back into the bulb pan. So I took another bulb pan upside down under it and I put the hanger on that and I let it grow for four more years. And I don't think this is going to show up on my Zoom. So we're gonna go past it and hope that this will show up. So I, this is supposed to be a video of me walking around this plant, but it doesn't show up in the thing. This is the award slide. And the reason that I took the video, I've, I posted the video on uh, Facebook and showed this is what it took me six hours to clean this plant. And I did it too late. So I knocked a whole bunch of lips off and I had to cut off about 20 flowers that were damaged. But anyway, I finally got it to judging and I got a CCE of 98.2 points and who's counting, right? Anything I can do, you can do better. So as the sun sets over the Pacific on our wonderful talk of bubble film heaven, are you ready for your surprise test? So first question, do you water one side or all sides? All sides. All sides. All sides, that's right. Turn your, uh, turn your microphones on and call out because if I don't hear you calling out, I'm gonna think you don't know. So you're now in the top 50 percentile. Air, do you want air day and night? Yes, yes. 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 day and fresh night. Air. Yes. yes, fresh air night. day and night, right you are. You're now in the top 25 percentile. Food, how do you make your food go twice as far? Weekly, 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 weekly. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I shouldn't have put this up. You make your food go twice as far by watering first. You're going to oh, use God. less. Then you make it go four times as far by using half strength. That gives you weekly. And if you do it every week, it's weekly, weekly. You're now in the top 12 percentile. How do you, do you want bright shade or dark shade? Bright, bright shade. shade. Bright shade. Bright shade is right. Use your hand to tell how much bright shade you've got. Water, air, food, light, home. Do you grow in plastic or clay? Plastic. plastic. Are your horizontal? Are your mounts horizontal or vertical? Horizontal. I know. And you're going to turn. You go, How do I do these horizontally? Well, you're going to have to learn how to do that. You know, percentile. <laughs> you can buy those four-way Vanda hangers. And you can drill holes in the corners of a lot of stuff mm -hmm. and hang them that way. So anyway, sickness. When is it cool to spray chemicals? When it's, it's cool. cool. It's cool. cool. Yeah. And you guys know when it, you can tell it's going to be cloudy and cool for the next four days. No problem with spraying. The way it is in Florida, as soon as I would spray, the sun would come out. So after I did that <laughs> three or four times, and said bad words, I finally started saying, <laughs> I'm gonna wait till late in the afternoon. So you're now in the top one percentile. Epsom salts, do you want it? Yeah. Yes. yes. How yes. often do you use it? Once a month. 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 You don't have to, if I didn't do it for 10 years and we still got cultural awards, but I went to a, a seminar and I went to a talk where somebody uh, reminded me of the importance of magnesium. And I said, oh golly, I haven't done that in years. And I went home and did it. And the trick with this is to not turn around and do it again a week later 
because mm -hmm. you don't want to overdose them with magnesium. They just need a little bit. And if you're not giving it to them, they have to try to take it from the back of the plant and move it to the front. And that's hard to do. So give them Epsom salts and you'll see the new growths come out twice the size that they came out before because the plants have what they need to make more stuff. Hmm. Okay, and finally, finally is poo good or bad? Good. good. It is much more better. -er. You're now in the top <laughs> one forwarder percentile. There's only one way to get a perfect score, become one of Bill's best and a master Waffle House grower. And that's to answer the next question correctly with no cues. Who is your favorite speaker? <laughs> oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm doing a talk for the uh, Catlia Symposium a year or two ago and I'm hunting up some slides and I run across the slide that was taken in Belize in 1989, which is quickly 30 years ago. Now, I don't know about you, but I've got a picture in my head of what I look like, and this is what it is. And <laughs> I walk by a mirror and I say, who is this old, fall, fat, bald guy? I'm, I'm still the stud in here like this, and I'm thinking, whatever happened to this guy? <laughs> well, this is what happened to him. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, my Lord. That's funny. Okay. Are there any questions? Yes. I'd love to ask you. So the neem oil, how do you apply it? Do you dilute it to a spray? That is a fabulous question. Thank you very much. I completely forgot to go in on that. Neem oil, uh, buy yourself some palm olive dishwashing detergent. And if you, um, if you use Dawn or Ivory or Basic H or anything else, it's not going to work. Neem oil and palm olive. The guy from Dynagro, uh, Dave Neal, called me up and said, how did you like the product that I sent you? And I said, I couldn't get it to dissolve. And he said, use hot water and palm olive. And I said, oh, okay. And when I did, it immediately turned to yellow milk instead of uh, little chicken fat globules. It looks, when you pour it, and when you buy it, read and follow label directions, and the label directions for the uh, <laughs> Southern Ag and Dynagro is one ounce per gallon. So I'm gonna, I got a pump up sprayer, two gallon pump up sprayer, because I've got thousands of plants. But anyway, I take an amount of water sufficient to my needs, and you do the same thing. I, I take up quart of water and I put it in the microwave and I nuke it and I get it hot. Then I put in my two ounces of neem oil and my squirt of palm olive and I stir it with a spoon and it turns to yellow milk immediately. And that's why I use palm olive and not ivory or dawn or anything else. Palm olive's the only one that works and the green one I like the best. Anyway, I put the two together and now I got yellow milk and a hot quart of water and I pour that into my two gallon pump up sprayer and I fill it up with the rest of the water and I put on the top and I pump it up and I go spray. As the, as the uh, tank is laying against my leg, I can feel that the water's warm. It's not hot, but it's not cold. When it gets cold, it starts to separate out. So I'm finished spraying before, I'm, uh, before it cools. So that's how I use it, but that's exactly what I do start to finish. And if you do the same thing, you'll get tremendous results. It's very, very effective. You can hold the plant and spray it and have the neem oil running down your arm and it's not gonna give you, you know, a liver cancer or lesions on your face or anything like that. It's good stuff to use. So that's how you're, I use you're it. Using, you're using what? it as a foliar spray, spray, not as a drench. Yeah, most of the time, insects and fungus and problems are up in the plant. They're not down in the mix. That's fungus problems more. You can get mealy bugs and things can get down on the roots. But when I'm spraying, two things. First off, I'm using my poo. I'm not necessarily going to go and spray every plant that I've got. I'm going to spray the plant where I found the mealy bug and the two or three plants around it. 
So I'm not necessarily going to have to spray a whole everything that I've got, but I go to the area where I have the problem and I spray those plants there because if you've got a mealybug on one plant, you're going to have mealybugs around. They're born pregnant. They can live on the bench away from plants for months. So, and you got to keep your poo up because they're a barbarians and they work 24 hours a day and they're constant. All you can do is slow them down, which is why I like to grow inside something. So you can try to separate inside from outside and keep the barbarians away. It's a little easier to do. What kind of sprayer do you use? Because I've clogged up so many that I couldn't ever get them unclogged. Is there a secret sprayer to use? Uh, no, not really. There, actually, there's a, a sprayer. I think you can get them at Home Depot. That's about a quart and a half size. It's got a little uh, pump up through the top of it and it's got a handle that you can hold it and it holds about a quart of water, maybe a quart and a half. Those are probably best. Um, Is it all, if, all, all, all plastic or do you have a metal sprayer head on it? Uh, I think they're all plastic now. Okay. I like to try to get things all plastic because every now and then I wanna spray Clorox and uh, chlorine really gets, if it's got metal stuff inside, the chlorine eats it up. I also had the same problem with, if you don't clean your sprayer when you're done, it can get clogged. Yeah. So I do, I do spray water through the, you know, I, I rinse the sprayer out every time when I'm done and fill it up with water, rinse it out two or three times and then mm. put some water in it and turn the sprayer on and let the water run through that nozzle and that helps. It doesn't work all the time, but it helps better. Val, you didn't talk about water quality. What kind of water do you use? I have a well. My well water is fairly good. Uh, I know a number of people that use city water, which is not as good as well water, but they still get good quality plants. Uh, water quality, you can do an entire day's worth of talk on water quality. Rainwater is usually better than city water. Uh, you guys get rain a lot so that you can save rainwater. If you uh, want to drop barrels down in the ground, you can keep the water at a cooler temperature in the summertime and warmer in the wintertime. Uh, if you have city water, you can pour that into a bucket and let it sit for a couple of days and the solids will fall to the bottom of the bucket and the gases will come off the top and you'll be left with water that's better quality, it's still got a higher pH, but it's better quality than it came out of the tap. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. If you've got uh, the mineral deposits that are, if you've got a lot of mineral deposits, you'll see white uh, circular marks on your leaves and you'll see that crusty buildup and when you try to clean it off with a wet rag it looks like it goes away but as soon as the leaf dries it comes back those are mineral deposits and that's why I, when I clean my leaves I use lemon juice and the toe of a sock mm -hmm. over my fingers to clean the leaves oh, uh, and there's also several videos where I show uh, there's a plan I took a uh, uh, Elizabeth Ann that I bread myself and I saw it coming into bloom and I started a video that takes a half an hour and it's over a period of a month that this flower, that this plant is beginning to come out into bloom. I show you how to protect the spikes and how to move the spikes and how to clean the leaves and how to transport it to judging and all of that. That's in that ebook. But I use lemon juice on the leaves because lemon juice is the only thing that's gonna take, it's not the only thing, but it takes the mineral deposits off quickly. Ginger ale works, milk works. I don't like milk. Ginger ale, you can drink while you're using it. Lemon <laughs> juice, we have a lemon tree. And so I've got lemons all the time. So I use what we've got. Anything I can do, you can do too. Better still. So any other questions? All right, I'm gonna stop sharing and allow you to go back to your regular meeting thank you very much for having me and uh thank i'd be you. happy thank you thank, thank you. you very much you're thank quite you. welcome 
my uh, my email address, dukestoms at verizon.net is uh, on the website, bubblefilms.com. If you send me emails, I most of the time I don't answer the phone, but I answer my emails. And so if you send me an email, I will answer it. And if you get on the uh, on the ebook list, you'll get the uh, links to all of the ebook, just like Kathy Barrett does. <laughs> so thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy your meeting and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Happy New Year. Bye -bye. Happy New Year. Thank Happy you. New Year. Stay safe, stay sane. Happy stay growing COVID too. free. And healthy. Um, oh yes. All right. Thank you. Well, um, thanks every thanks, Bill. Thanks everyone. We're we're going strong. We have uh, about 74 people still on, and we're about to go into show and tell. Which uh, Lynn, are you ready to go? Uh, you're on mute. Right. <clears throat> Unmute, okay. There you go, we can hear you. Uh, and my usual, I have to uh, figure out <laughs> how to... Um, the meetings are so far screen, apart, you forget between them. I know, screen share. I'm, I'm hovering down here on the bottom. You'll find it. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting the little screen share to pop up. Bill, you always tell me I have to open the um, slideshow first, right? All right, open the slideshow first. Yep. Then do sharing. I can't find the share. It's not, the little icon's not popping up. Oh, does she have to be co-host? Right, no, no. Um, like I've got screen share right here. So you've opened the slideshow, is this correct? Yep, I have. Okay. Now hit the little Windows icon and the letter D. Little weird character next to the function key. Got it. Okay. Now my slideshow, my uh, slideshow went away. It's everything's down in the toolbar at the bottom. Now you hit this little zoom thing. It looks like a little TV camera. The blue thing with a white TV mm -hmm. camera. Yeah. Now your zoom oh. screen comes up. Right. So um, you have your Zoom screen with all of us in it, right? No, no, because I have my show and my uh, slideshow up. Well, you hit the little D, the Windows and the D key. The slideshow should have gone away. It did. Leave it there. Okay. Now hit the Zoom button on the bottom down there, in the toolbar at the bottom. Okay. Now, zoom is up, correct? Yes. Okay. Now at the bottom of that should be a share screen. Green. Uh, no. <laughs> I wish there were. No. Uh, the other possibility is you're not full screen. It's full screen to me. It should be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. At the bottom of the screen where you have mute, stop video, participants, chat, or share screen, record, etc. So you see, uh, I'm so sorry. You see all of us, is this correct? No, I don't. What do you see? I see my screen, my um, slideshow. Did uh, Jeff give you permission to again, again, Lynn? Yeah. Uh, don't bring up the slideshow. Please do not bring up the slideshow. We're not there yet. Click on Zoom, the, the camera. All right, we're trying to get her to get the Zoom up. I did, I did, I did. Okay. So everything else is gone except Zoom. Is this correct? Well, I've got two screens going actually. So I'll that do it again, Joy. That could make it messy. But on the one that with the Zoom where you have all the little people, is that up? No, I think I'll end my slideshow. No, no, no. <laughs> Basically what we're trying to do is to get you to open Zoom after opening slideshow and, may, and minimizing it. 
Do you understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. So after hold on, hold on. Okay, Lynn, shall we try again? Yeah. Okay. So you have your slideshow, you had your slideshow open, yes? Yes. Okay. Now, where you are, and please do not do anything other than exactly what I'm telling you, okay? Okay, yep. Okay, hit the little Windows key. It's the third one from the left on the bottom row and the yep. letter simultaneously. Hold that down and the letter D? That is correct. Dog. Correct. So okay. the only thing that should be up is your normal desktop, whatever you have, picture you have there. Right. And then on the bottom are some little icons. Right. Okay. One of them is a zoom icon. It's a blue one with a white camera in it. Got it. I'm clicking on it. Okay. Click that one. Now the zoom comes up. What do you see now? Uh, it's saying sign in, but I'm in. Okay. Clearly you're in because we see you. You still see me? Yes. Well, then I'm in. Okay. Hold on. I'm going to call my husband. <laughs> Excuse me. Not that difficult. Oh, it is. Tom? Tom? All right, anyone have any jokes? No? I have a question. Yep. I won one of the drawing for the nursery in Hawaii. Yes. Um, did anybody else look at all of the costs of trying to pick a plant and have it shipped? It was about three times the value of what the plant was. Colin, I order um, some plants from H&R and they ship my raffle plants as well. Oh, from the, from the place from Maui? This no, in Oahu. Life. Did she get back to you? Because I know she broke her leg and was out for a while. Did, did Kathy, I think it was Kathy, did she get back to you? Um, no, I was just looking at the website, right. trying to figure out what I wanted. And I just decided to wait till I go to Kauai later this year. <laughs> yeah. I just was curious if anybody else had done it even. Yeah, it's like a minimum order of $40 and then yeah. the handling charge and then the shipping on top of that. Yeah. Right. It, it added up quickly. Yeah. Yeah. The 15% of the value of the plant is the shipping charge. So. Yeah. yeah. Do you still hear me? I can't get slide share or um, I can't get screen share, sweetie. Screen share. Did you just now try it? Yeah, I've been trying. So I'm still on Zoom because they can hear me. Okay, so. see me. Here's the expert. Where's. Hi, Tom. The internet's been behaving strangely. It has. It cut me out once during the yeah. talk. <clears throat> Shall I get out of Zoom and get back in again? Yeah, let's do that. If you go to my email, you find the. Let me stay on there for just a second. Yep. <clears throat> Some reason. Is that two? You guys still hear me? Yes, we, yeah, we hear you. <clears throat> okay, um, going to be waiting. Um, talk about the raffle ticket last time from uh, this is Angelic from Orchid Design. I only filled out the three orders last time. I'm still waiting for I think twelve of them. Um, I know that on my website not many things that um, I post. Um, you guys can send me um, the wish list. What are you looking for? 
I have thousands of species and hybrid um, I grow, but not I'm not selling all of them. But if you're looking for something special, just let me know. My email is um, angelic at orchidie.com. There you are, you're yeah. sharing. Thanks, Angelique. Um, Lynn, we see it, you're up. Good. All right. Thank you, Angelique. Welcome. Angelique, you're gonna see some of your flowers tonight. <laughs> oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> I thought I missed it again. Okay, sorry, folks. Doesn't get easier for me, I don't know why. <laughs> okay, so that's a hard act to follow, but we have an amazing, um, varied show and tell tonight with 94 pictures wow. and orchid photos from 30 different members, which is a record. And um, let's get started. So the order in which I'm showing them is the order in which I receive them. And just a little reminder, I like to end the show with an animal orchid photo. So please send me yours. So we'll start with Carol DiGiorgio's Oncidium Siku Marguerite, which he has blooming in, in her house. This is a cross made about 20 years ago of Twinkle by Soto Anum, and it has many fragrant little flowers about three quarters of an inch wide. This is a very rewarding windowsill grower, and it or its twinkle parent are often available for sale in the trade. Um, Brookside orchids on the peninsula is a good source, and they often go to the local farmers markets where they have them available. Carol's uh, Zygo States or Zygo uh, QF Atlanta Love is a complex Zygo hy hybrid which is also blooming inside her house. The waxy flowers are very long lasting and I'm sure they're fragrant as most zygos are. So this is a fun plant for any collection. Jeff Tyler, Jeff, if you're on, welcome back. We haven't seen you for a while. He shows us this stunning Bulbophyllum ping tongense. This is a low elevation, warm growing epiphyte from Ping Tong County of Southern Taiwan. It has also been published as a seropetalum ping tongense. Jeff's plant is immaculate, as you can see. The most recent award on Ping Tong Yens was in HCC in 2012, and that plant had three flowers. Uh, so Jeff's plant gets a round of applause, I think. These uh, flowers are over an inch in size with little hinge lips, as Bill said. Jeff also shows us Epidendrum coriofolium. This is a charming little species from Mexico, Costa Rica, and Panama at elevations from about 4,000 to 6,000 feet. The flowers are about an inch and a half. They're long lasting. The color is variable. I've seen them um, from this clear chartreuse to a, a deep bronze red. They are fragrant, though I find that mine, has a, mine doesn't have a very pleasing scent. Uh, I apologize that the flower close up here is probably not oriented properly, but I made it vertical so it wouldn't, so I could, uh, didn't have to reduce it anymore to get it on the screen. Jeff also shows a Stenorhynchus albedo maculatum. This was first described by Eric Christensen in 2005. It's found in Colombia and Venezuela as a medium sized cold growing terrestrial. There's a basal rosette of uh, beautiful dark green and silver leaves with this tall inflorescence, which has many tubular little flowers all over the, um, the inflorescence. And it blooms over a long period. This is a one of the jewel orchids because it's prized for its foliage as much as for its flowers. Does it go dormant after it's flowering? I, most of these do, so I would guess it does. Thanks. Jeff is on, he can pipe in. Jeff also shows us Dendrobium peguanum variety alba. This is a miniature species from India, Burma, and maybe into Thailand at elevations up to about 1400 feet. It's often growing on rocks near streams, so it prefers warm, humid areas. And we can see that Jeff has it potted in um, its sphagnum um, for the moisture retention. The flowers are about three quarters of an inch. And Jeff shows us the alba form here, while the more typical form has brown to rose pink um, on the, the lip ruffles. Looks like Jeff's plant has at least 10 or 12 flowers, which is a lot for this little tiny plant. Jeff also shows us this outstanding Dendrobium Aussie High Low. So this is new to me. This is a primary hybrid of Dendrobium Cuthbertsonii by Levifolium, two of our favorites. These are two great parents from New Guinea that many of us grow, but this hybrid is not common in the United States. In fact, AOS just awarded it 
for the first time this June with just four flowers and two buds. As you can see in the photo on the, the bottom right, uh, the leaves are covered in little warts, which it gets from the Cuthbertsonii parent and the, the texture of the flower is very crystalline. Thanks Jeff for sharing this one with us. I hope we see more of this hybrid in the US. Next, we have Judy Carney. She shows us her Stellus Gemma, or Gemma, I'm not sure which, from the uh, Latin word for jewel, which this is. She has it mounted on a slab of cork, and the half inch flowers are on a pendulous inflorescence, which comes from the base of the, uh, the gray green glaucous leaves. The sepals are creamy white surrounding the reddish brown petals. Oops, sorry. So these are actually petals in here. Um, so the petals are reddish brown, as is the lip. This is a species from Colombia, Peru, and Ecuador, and I think the genus Stellis is underappreciated by most of us, including me. And this Gemma is a particularly lovely one for our collections. Judy shows us Sophronitis vitigiana, which the geneticists, of course, have renamed Cattleya vitigiana in about 2008. <clears throat> I'm not changing my tags. This is a lovely miniature species from Brazil with three inch salmon pink flowers on a small plant with one inch pseudobulbs. It's found in the wild at about 700 to 2000 meters as an epiphyte on rough bark trees and humid forest. So that tells us that it's best grown in intermediate temperatures mounted on cork as Judy has it here uh, with bright light and ample water year round <clears throat> with little less water in the coldest part of the winter. These two flowers are really stunning. Judy got this plant from Peter T. Lynn at a Sacramento Speakers Day. And Peter Lynn's uh, Diamond Orchids is a good domestic online source for these mini Cattleya and Sophronitis species. This is Judy's Dracula Hertzii, a species found in the cool cloud forests of Colombia and Ecuador at about 5,000 to 6,500 feet. The inflorescences emerge from, oops, emerge from the bottom of the plant, as you can see here, where, where Judy's holding it. And so it has to be grown in an open basket or a net pot so the, um, the inflorescence can descend. Uh, let's see, the flower is about four inches wide by about 10 inches long, including the, the caudae or the little tails. And John Leathers received an HCC on Hertzii in 1993 at the San Francisco Orchid Show, and he gave it this clonal name, Pui's Y. I think this is probably after um, Pui Chin, who many of you know. Yeah. This is Judy's Dendrobium limpidum, which is a delightful miniature species from Papua New Guinea, where it's found above 5,000 feet in wet montane florist, forests. It produces these, these lovely clusters. Why does it do that anyway? I'm not going to move that anymore. These lovely um, clusters of bright rose purple flowers, and the individual flowers are under about a half an inch. If this is a rewarding cool to intermediate grower mounted as Judy displays it with, um, with regular water and good humidity. Deborah Vales Qualter shows us three of her unnamed symbidiums. I love the presentation of this one with the uh, shell pink flowers and they're all lined up and looking at us with their little open faces, which to me look like they're laughing at us. <laughs> this is very cute. And the next one, Deborah's second symbidium um, has lovely creamy white sepals and petals and a nicely contrasting rose and deep magenta lip with two yellow keels down the center. I think th these may look like they're laughing at us too. And these beautiful gold and bronze symbidiums from Deborah, they're just beginning to open for her with another inflorescence opening um, off to the, the right rear. It looks like Deborah's growing her symbidiums outside which is the preference in the Bay Area, and hers are certainly putting on a beautiful show for her. Tom Pickford is trying out his new clip-on close-up lens for his iPhone. You can see his little clip-on lens there to the left. And uh, he shows us the results with his Cattleya cernua. This was formerly Sophronita cernua, a miniature from Brazil to Northeastern Argentina. It grows as both an epiphyte and a lithophyte near sea level. So this is an intermediate to warm grower. It can take temperatures over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It's most often found high in the tree canopy, often um, exposed to full sun. So it needs fairly bright light to bloom well. Tom flowers his consistently in his cool greenhouse. 
and he has it mounted, but windowsill growers can also grow it in uh, fast draining medium with some added perlite or sphagnum. Just charming little flowers. Tom also shows us three shots, I think he likes this orchid, of his Chlysocentron gokosingii. This is a species that's endemic to Borneo with semi terete leaves and clusters of waxy sky blue translucent flowers. They're about um, half an hour, half an inch in diameter and with a distinct mentum or chin. Tom grows this in his cool greenhouse, which is only heated to about 43 degrees. And he has it on his water wall where it gets daily misting. It looks like there's another flower cluster um, still to open below the flowers that are shown. And oh, by the way, on Sunday, Tom took this for judging and it was awarded an 84 point AM. So congratulations to Tom. Let's hear the applause. Yes. Tom also shows us Calonistele sulfurea, an epiphytic species from Malaya, Borneo and the Philippines at elevations between 600 and 8,000 feet. That's a big range. So it's a very adaptable little orchid. The genus is closely related to Selogeny. The flower is about an inch and a quarter with crystalline texture and a very, very prominent lip. Looks like it has its tongue stuck out. It has keels or, or ridges on that lip to show the pollinator the, the way to the prize. Tom bought this at the 2017 Sacramento Speakers Day where it was donated by Carol Zoltowski. It's very nice. Uh, Chris Nietro, our SFOS newsletter editor, shows us two color forms of Sarcochylus dilatatus. Chris grows them outdoors and says the flowers are about the size of a, a penny. This is obviously a miniature species and it's endemic to Northern Australia where it grows as an epiphyte in drier rainforest, which means high humidity and, and good air movement. Mary Garrison and Ron Parsons in their compendium of miniature orchids indicate that it is rarely seen in collections outside of Australia and that it can be very difficult to maintain in cultivation for long periods. But looking at the, the roots on Chris's plant, it looks like it's been growing successfully for him for quite some time. Chris also shows us Paphiopetalum berkei by Malapuents. This hybrid was just registered by Kintal Farms in Hawaii in 2018. And uh, they named the hybrid Path QF Lito. So you may want to change your tag on that, Chris. Um, Chris shows us his plant on the left with the first flower open, and then on the right with both flowers open. He says it's slightly, slightly fragrant. The flowers are about five inches wide, and he grows it indoors. This is Chris, Chris's Path Tigrinum blooming out of season for him with its second bloom this year. This is really a striking species from Western Yunnan, China, where it grows in, in damp and slightly shady locations from 4,000 to 700 feet. The flower is about four, four and a half inches wide and the contrasting bars on that dorsal sepal and the blush of purple on the petals so make it really, really a distinctive path. It's lovely. Chris also, also shows us Fal Zhengmin Anaconda Yafon. This is a complex hybrid with fabulous spots that are tiny at the tips to very concentrated or, or warty uh, raised as the pigment collects near the, near the lip. Chris always adds some of his orchid photos to the monthly um, SFOS newsletter, but seeing them on the large screen like this, for me, it really makes them pop. I can really see them. Chris says this was his most popular on Facebook in 2020. Renata Johnson shows us three gorgeous Cattleya hybrids. The first is BLC Nakuchi Mission Valley. Nakuchi is an old hybrid registered in 1952 and the clone Mission Valley was awarded in 1957 an AM of 81 points to Ray and Ruby Alberts of Newark, California. I don't know if they used to be San Francisco members. The awarded plant had eight flowers and it looks like Renata has at least eight flowers plus three buds. This is a beautifully grown plant, nice job. Renata's L.C. Dinard received its AM from the American Orchid Society in Illinois in 2001, and the clone was given the name Blue Heaven. We can see why. The petals and sepals are a lovely lavender blue, and the award description of the flower describes the lip as, quote, pleasingly ruffled indigo purple 
with the yellow throat veined lighter purple. Close quotes. This is beautiful, Renata. And this is her third beauty, Potanara Erin Kobayashi by Marlene Lundquist. I found that it was registered by Carmela Orcas of Hawaii in 2011, and the hybrid was named BRLC Memoria Bob Crowder. Bob was a longtime member of Marin Orchid Society, and he died scuba diving in Asia, which was another one of his passions. He grew his orchids, which were mostly big, uh, fluffy, beautiful cattleyas. He grew them under lights in a large space he carved out under his condominium on stilts in Tiburon. And I know this because the family donated Bob's collection to the Marin Orchid Society and gave us two days get, to get all of them out of there, which meant schlepping them up a very steep hillside. And the deal was we had to remove all of his racks, lights, and paraphernalia as well, because they wanted to put it on the market post haste. So at any rate, this is a beautiful hybrid, a name for a good friend and devoted orchid grower. Roberta Fox shows us her an Ancestral Chylus rochildianus. This is a charming little epiphytic species native to a wide area of West and Central Africa at a range, a range of elevations. <clears throat> the little pseudobulbs are shaped like Hershey's Kisses. I don't know if you can see that in the, in the photo. And the leaves, which are mostly deciduous, arise from the tip of the kiss. The flower inflorescence arises from the base of that little Hershey, Hershey's Kiss pseudobulb. The flowers are about two inches and they're lightly fragrant. And I just, I love the unusual dusty rose color. This is Roberta's Epigenium treacherianum, which the tax taxonomist lumped into the very large genus of Dendrobium about 15 years ago. Roberta says she's not changing her tags. The species is native to fairly low elevations in Borneo and the Philippines. So it's a warm to intermediate grower which Roberta grows in her greenhouse, not outdoors. These can grow into very large specimen plants. Tom Perliti had his awarded um, a cultural award of excellence in 2005 with 375 flowers on it. Roberta says this is the first time it's bloomed in her care and she looks forward to it growing up. <clears throat> Roberta shows us her Ascocentrum, now a Vanda, um, Garii, a species native to a range of elevations in Thailand and Malaya. It grows in deciduous forests, so it needs especially bright light in the winter when the trees have deciduated. And the flowers are half an inch to three quarters of an inch. The previous owner of this plant grew it in an unheated greenhouse, but Roberta is growing it with a bit more warmth very successfully. Eric Christensen said that these plants seldom outgrow a four inch pot. So this is a good windowsill candidate with bright light. You can grow them in a slat basket or with little or no potting medium. Ascocentrum is often crossed with Vandas to give us Ascocenda, but they've all been lumped into Vanda now anyway. <laughs> Roberta shows us Dendrobium strongylanthum, a species native to Yunnan province in China and Northwest Thailand and Tibet at elevations from about 1,000 to 2,000 meters. It grows easily outdoors for her in coastal Southern California, she's in Costa Mesa. And I suspect it would grow well outdoors here, protected around the Bay Area. Individual flowers are about an inch and that brush-like uh, inflorescence emerges from, the, from bare canes. Roberta says she doesn't particularly dry it out in the winter, but since it's mounted, it does dry rapidly after she waters it. Excuse me. This is my Oncidium or Odontiota hetonensis, which is a primary hybrid of Oncidium strictum by Oncidium serosum, which are both cool growers from Ecuador, Peru, and Colombia. So I grow this in my cool greenhouse with temps down in the low 40s. So it's a candidate for growing outdoors in the Bay Area. It's maybe a little delicate for that. I grow it potted in a mix of just medium orchiata, and those delicate little pink dancing lady flowers are about um, an inch and a half to two inches. This is my area coronaria, a species from the Himalaya region at elevations from 2,500 to 8,000 feet. And I've really struggled to give this conditions that make it happy during the five years that I've had it. I grew it outdoors, protected for several years and it struggled. The leaves always looked ratty 
and it just didn't bloom. So I moved it to my intermediate greenhouse where it continued to mope. And finally, a year ago, I rented space in a cool greenhouse with night temps in the low 40s and it's finally blooming. So I do love the contrast of the creamy sepals and petals with the, the maroon stripes in the lip and the yellow midlobe. And I'm hoping it'll just continue to thrive now. And this is my Lelia furfuracea, a Mexican high elevation species, which Ron Parson says is the coolest growing of the Mexican Lelias. <clears throat> so it would do, out, will do well outdoors but I grow it in my cool greenhouse mounted on a slab of cork bark. It needs a definite dry rest during the winter. I recently purchased an albiform uh, furfuracea from Unir Peralta, and I'm looking forward to that blooming in the next year or two. My plant's only about seven inches and the flowers are about three inches. It has kind of a light soapy fragrance. So on the right, the larger picture is my Cattleya gratiqua, Grotrixii, which is a primary hybrid made by Charles Worth in 1901 of Cattleya tenebrosa by Coccinia. The name designates the year 1901 because just to be really confusing, there's also a Cattleya Grotrixii, the same name, made a few years earlier in 1897 by a hybridizer named Gratrix with two completely different parrots, Cat Granulosa by Cat Harrisoniana and that's it on the left. I could only find that one photo of it. Um, and it looks a lot like the 1901 hybrid, but with pretty distinct differences in the lip, I think. My plant is uh, five inches tall. The flower is about three inches wide and it's a merit clone of the awarded Grex Rotor, which uh, I purchased this last year from um, Alan Koch at Gold Country. Larry Roberts shows us his Miltonia Maui Mist Golden Gate with lovely big flowers. There's only been one AOS award on this hybrid an HCC in 2007, which was awarded in Texas. So I'm not sure how I get the name, clonal name of Golden Gate, but I suspect they may have purchased it from Tom Perlidi of Golden Gate Orchids. I believe it's fragrant and the dark waterfall patterns on the lip are really lovely. And uh, Miltonias are great windowsill plants their fragrance will fill the room. Tanya Lamb shows us Catacetum Lada Lexman, uh, Fred Clark hybrid, just registered in 2017, and it already has six AOS awards. On the right side, I show three of the awarded flowers of the same hybrid, and you can see how variable they are because it's, it is such a complex hybrid. Each clone is influenced differently by the parents and the grandparents. These Catacetum hybrids are I think are pretty interesting to see and they're, they are also good windowsill candidates. Tanya shows us Path Chinying Delight, a hybrid of Spicerianum crossed with Stone Lovely. It's about two thirds Spicerianum because Stone Lovely has Spicerianum in its background. And we can really see the influence of Spicerianum. I have a little picture of Spicerianum on the right. Um, we see the influence of Spicerianum in the shape and the the markings on the dorsal sepal and the ruffling on the petals. Tanya's hybrid has lovely little tiny burgundy spots on the sepal and the petals, which seem to radiate out from the lip. This is Tanya's Proctovola key lime stars. First of all, I had to see what a Proctovola is. It's not a physician. This is a Brasavola crossed with Catle Catlechia, which is a Catlea crossed with Prosthechia. So having said that, this is not really a very complex hybrid. The diagram on the left shows that it has just three components in its parentage. It was made by Roy Tokunaga, registered in 2019. Received its first award earlier this year was just two flowers. So Tanya's has three. She's doing a great job growing this. Uh, the flowers are really lovely. It's another good windowsill candidate as it only needs medium light and intermediate temperatures. This is Tanya's Vanda Pakchong Newland, a gorgeous hybrid of, of, uh, with lots of Vanda Sandoriana in it to give it that full round flat shape that we love in Vandas. The flowers are nicely spaced. They're not crowded on the inflorescence. This is just a beautiful Vanda. So if you have the space and great light to grow it as well as Tanya is, this is one to look for. This is Jeff's Collage of Orchids. 
which had been blooming for him since Christmas time. He posted it on Instagram and wanted to share it with us tonight. In the top row, he shows us Lely Anceps, then Phragmopedium cardinal, which is a primary hybrid of Phragsidenii by Schlimii. We'll see another one later. And then another Lely Anceps, Mini Harry. In the second row, we have Paphiopedalum Lowii compact by Hainaldianum. Then in the middle, Path Worthy Fred, and then on the right, uh, Phalaenopsis Ox Golden Apple. In the bottom row, he has Ren and Stylus Bangkok Beauty. This is a hybrid of Renanthera with Rinko Stylus, has just stunning color. Um, in the middle is Lelia Finkeniana Kennedy's, which is a primary hybrid of Anceps by Albida. We'll see another one of those later. And finally, Cymbidium X Gamianum. Jeff sent us a separate slide of this cymbidium, and here it is. So this is Jeff's cymbidium ex gamianum. This is a species which is a natural hybrid, meaning it occurs in nature, uh, and hybridized itself between the um, species parents of cymbidium elegans and cymbidium erythraeum. It's found in the Himalayas, uh, about 1,200 to 1,800 meters. The name is shown as ex gamianum to indicate that it's a naturally occurring hybrid. Jeff says he particularly likes it for the more delicate shape compared to the more typical um, heavy fleshy cymbidiums. Thank you. Beautiful in yes. your house, Jeff. Nice photo too. And this is Susan Anderson showing us her Lelia Anceps. This is a cross of a Guerrero type Anceps crossed with Mendenhall 4N. Anceps is a wonderful hardy species from Mexico, which should be in every Bay Area collection. It uh, grows well outdoors, protected, along with your cymbidiums. And Anceps has a number of color forms and varieties, which are all worth collecting. This is one of the true Lelias, meaning that the taxonomists have not moved it into Catlea. And in Mexico, Anceps is known as El Toro, the bull. Susan shows us her Catlea Percivaliana summit, commonly known as the Christmas orchid, because it reliably blooms at Christmas time. It's a species from Venezuela and Colombia, and it needs more warmth than the Lelia Anceps. Susan grows this in her intermediate greenhouse with minimum night temperatures of about 58 degrees. The presentation of these four large showy blooms side by side is, I think is really stunning with the, their very frilly lips. They need very bright light to bloom as well as Susan's is blooming. This is Susan's Bulbophyllum Fascinator. The name means fascinating bulbo, and it is. With that very elaborate lip, which we see uh, blown up on the right, with the fringed or fimbriated dorsal sepal above it, and two distinctive keels, those um, kind of, uh, I guess, cordovan colored keels. This is a worm grower from Malaya and Laos, where it prefers shade, moist conditions, and plenty of air movement. So that's exactly what we heard from Bill. This flower can be as much as eight or nine inches long with those long cauda. Susan's little Pleurothallus leptotifolia gold country. Susan says this was in a tiny pot until she mounted it this past summer. And I'm pretty sure I don't have it displayed in the right direction, but um, showing it horizontally, let me blow it up a little more. A year from now, I bet it'll completely cover the, the cork mount and have hundreds of tiny flowers, which are only about a third of an inch. This miniature species is found in Brazil at around 3,200 feet. And the name Leptotifolia uh, refers to the leaves, which are like those of Leptodes. This is Stuart Medeker, his uh, Dendrobium hilda poxon. This is a primary hybrid of two Australian species, Speciosa, which we know can grow uh, to be the size of a Volkswagen bug and have up to 40 flowers on an inflorescence, crossed with Dendrobium tetragonum which is a small species, which carries just three or four flowers on an inflorescence. So for Stewart's cross hilda poxon, they're more likely 15 to 20 flowers on a spike and the flowers have a uh, very spidery form that it gets from the tetragonum here. This is very interesting. This is Stewart's tuberolabium cotoense, a species from Taiwan, which is a small monopodial orchid like Phalaenopsis or monopodial and it grows epiphytically. The fragrant half-inch flowers are waxy. They're long-lasting, and they open 
somewhat sequentially with several open at a time as we see here. It grows best mounted as Stewart's is. Yeah, medium light, high humidity, warm temperatures. So this could be a windowsill or an indoor candidate as well if you can give it enough humidity. Dave Hermeyer shows us this charming little Dendrobium Jonathan's Glory with hot magenta flowers and many, many buds still to open. <clears throat> Dave says it's been blooming for about a month already. This is a mature plant and Dave's hand shows us that it's compact. This is a reliable bloomer and it can be grown outdoors, protected, but it's small enough to be a great windowsill orchid as it needs only medium light to bloom like this. Another great thing about Jonathan's Glory is it will bloom several, several times, several years out of the same leaf node. Not Dendrobiums, I think, are known for that almost uniquely. I you think they grow outdoor. It can be, yes. Yeah. These should be available through most of the local growers this time of year, maybe uh, Brookside at your local farmer's market. But this is really a rewarding plant to grow. This is Dave's Lele and Sep Helen by White Marble. It's considered a semi-alba because it has just a slight pink blush on the petals, meaning there's some anthocyanin in the, the, the pigment. As we said earlier, when we saw Susan Anderson's magenta ancepts, this is a wonderful Mexican species, which should be in every Bay Area collection because it loves our outdoor temperatures. And Dave shows us one of the many beautiful color forms. Dave says this plant has um, vigorous four foot spikes. <laughs> This is Dave's Dendrobium Ooh. Candy, candy Canifera by Harry Hanukkah Dreidel. <laughs> I got it out. I was able to say that. Good idea. He, he says it blooms reliably in December and he grows it in his greenhouse so the candy canes don't melt. And he puts it outdoors one night a year to be fertilized with reindeer poop. <laughs> You're great, Dave. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Uh, Andrea Laudate shows us three Phalaenopsis hybrids that she recently purchased from Orchid Design from Angelic Nguyen. This hybrid has a huge lip. So this whole bottom section is the lip. And big lip is the latest direction in Phalaenopsis breeding. This lip is almost as wide as the petals. This is Andrea's Phalaenopsis Chian Sen Dancer, a harlequin type with bright magenta in irregular blotches and a bright magenta lip. And the third is Phalaenopsis or Doritonopsis pudding puppy harlequin, which has an AM from AOS. The shape is round and flat, and the harlequin spots are very pleasingly spaced. This is nice, Andrea. She got it from me, too. Yeah, all three of them. Yeah. That's great. Miriam Rose shows us BLC Blanche Isaka Yuki, which has been awarded an FCC by AOS in Hawaii in 1997. Miriam has been a member of San Francisco since 2012, but I don't, sorry, I don't recall meeting her in person. So we're glad she's joining us via Zoom tonight. This is a complex Cattleya hybrid. As we can see in the genealogy chart on the lower left, it's been awarded, uh, it's very complex and it's been awarded for its full frilly snow white petals, contrasting with that amazing lip, uh, yellow throat and the, the dark, deep purple on the fringed edge. This is a beautiful flower. Miriam also shows us this beautifully grown Paph Spiceriana. She has four inflorescences on this plant, which shows uh, excellent culture. Spiceriana was named after an English officer in India in the 1800s, and the species has been found in India and Burma growing on limestone outcrops and cliffs between 1,000 and 4,200 feet, shaded by ferns and ginger. So that says it wants, it wants shade. The flowers are three and a half to four inches, and the petals have very interesting wavy edge, many tiny maroon dots. The dorsal sepal is crisp white with a dark purple stripe down the center. Spicerianum has many awards and has been used uh, extensively in hybridizing. And Miriam's photos really show off Spicerianum's best characteristics here. This is an intermediate to cool grower and also a candidate for windowsill growing with shaded or dappled light. Jan Anderson shows us this eye-popping orange Cattleya hybrid. Jan's granddaughter is caretaking her orchids 
while Jan is moving into Novato. And the, her granddaughter forgot to take, uh, to photograph the tag on this one. So we don't know what it is, but the color is fabulous. This is Jan's Lelia nemesis, which is a primary hybrid of the two Mexican species, Lelia anceps by Lelia superbians. Like its parents, it can be out, grown outdoors in the Bay Area. Jan also shows us her Phragmopedium cardinal. We saw a small photo of Jeff's in his Christmas collage, so it's nice to see this full plant and flower photo from Jan. Frag cardinal is a primary cross of Frag sedenii and Frag schlimii, and the parentage hails from Colombia. Bianca Masco Mascoro, oh. excuse me, is a new member. Welcome. Welcome. And this is her Paphio. Yeah, this is her Paphiopetalum Coco Sparkling Rose by Coco Hunting. It's an unregistered cross, and neither the hybrid nor its parents have been awarded. Each flower is wonderfully symmetrical. The dorsal sepal is spectacular, and getting two large blooms on it is excellent. So, uh, Bianca, nice. you might want to consider having this judge. Really nice job on this. Mm -hmm. Ernie Kettler shows his Bothrio Kylis bellus, which the taxonomists got after about 20 years ago, and they renamed it Celia Bella. Ernie says this was collected by Lil Severin, who many of you know. Uh, she collected it in Belize in 1985, and she gave him a piece of it in 1991. He grows it in his intermediate greenhouse, and it flowers every year. It's a species from Mexico and Central America, and it hates to be disturbed, so I grow mine in an um, inorganic mix of mostly lava rock, so I don't have to repot it. The crystalline, fl crystalline flowers are about two inches across, and they arise on a very short inflorescence at the base of the pseudobulbs. Ernie describes the fragrance as, quote, marzipan, chocolate-covered cherries, or almond oil, depending on your nose. <laughs> you said it's grow in intermediate and warm? Yes, intermediate, yeah. Um, Earl Rathbun shows us his Saffronitis cernua Taiwan strain. Saffronitis is a dwarf genus, as you can tell by the quarter that Earl typed to the Earl taped to the pot, found primarily in Brazil. He says that Peter Lin refers to it as the Taiwan strain, and while it certainly is not native to Taiwan, it's likely that it came from a Taiwan grower and possibly has been line bred by growers there. Cernua likes um, bright light, warm temperatures, high humidity, and year-round water, although somewhat less in winter. Try this on your windowsill. We also saw Tom Pickers. Try this um, potted or mounted if you can provide the growing conditions. The taxonomists, of course, have gotten after this one too. They've lumped Saffronitis into Cattleya, but most growers retain the name Saffronitis because the name brings to mind the small size and the, the beautiful red flowers. Cernua is highly awarded, has been used in over 100 hybrids, and it's used in breeding with Cattleyas to get smaller sized plants and the beautiful scarlet color, which is dominant, which we will see here with Earl Saffronitis scarlet imp, which of course the tax taxonomists now call Cattleya scarlet imp. I'm sure Earl's not changing his tags either. This is a primary hybrid of Saffronitis cernua, which we just saw. <coughs> and uh, Brevilabris. You may think it looks just like the Saffronitis or new apparent, which we just saw, but look at the difference in the lip in the bottom, bottom right inset. I think the lip is, is quite different in the two. Earl is growing this just beautifully, mounted on a piece of cork bark and his leaves are really pristine. This is beautiful, Earl. This is, this is Earl, but Earl says is, I'm sorry, Earl says this is Cattleya or SLC Earl's Choice. It's his latest and last hybrid. It is Cattleya Horus Maxima by Cattleya or SLC Circle of Life Mesmerize. And I'm sorry to hear that it's Earl's last hybrid, but it is a grand one to go out on with a bang. The flowers are huge, round and flat with lovely ruffling. The ruffled lip is spectacular with the yellow throat and contrasting purple at the apex. It even looks like it has a little white piquancy on the edge of the lip. Here's its family tree down uh, below the flower photo. So let's give Earl a round of applause for a great job. Well done. Oh, beautiful. 
That is beautiful. Nice girl. shape. Nice. nice choice. Yep. Chani Langland shows us Isabella Polkella. It was previously named Neolauchia Polkella, but it was a monotypic genus, which means that uh, Polkella was the only species in the, in the genus Neolauchia. So the taxonomists don't like monotypic genera. They moved it to Isabella. Either way, it's a precious little flower, which Chani has captured here with her new macro lens. The flower is only about a quarter of an inch, but a specimen sized plant can have a hundred or more flowers. It's grown mounted. It needs um, only moderate or diffuse light, but it needs plenty of water year round and it can thrive in nighttime temperatures down into the 40s. This is Chani's Achianthra leptodifolia gold country, Synonym Pleurothallus leptodifolia. And it's also been at some point Speclinia leptodifolia, it's been Papstiella. But whatever the name, these flowers again captured with um, Chani's macro lens. They're just delicate little gems about a third of an inch. Earlier we saw Susan Anderson's plant, which I inset here to the left to give a sense of the growth habit and the scale. And the name again indicates that the leaves look like those of, of Leptodes. It has creeping branch dry zones, which will cover this mound for Chani soon, I'm sure. I'm sure it's very sweet. John William Murphy is a new member also. Welcome, John. Wow. And he shares three of his blooming treasures. This is Bulbophyllum Elizabeth Ann, which is a primary hybrid of Bulbo longissimum, which we saw in Bill's talk, crossed with Rush Shildianum, which we also saw. Uh, these are both in the seropetalum section from Thailand and India, respectively. The flowers are nicely arranged in an umbel around the, that pendant inflorescence with a hinge lip that's characteristic of Bulbos. Elizabeth Ann has received awards from the US to Germany, to Australia, Southeast Asia. John grows it indoors. And this is also a good candidate for the windowsill as it requires um, moderate light, but you need to be able to give it space for those pendant inflorescences. It's fun to grow. This had an FCC also. Does it? Uh, buckleberry does, yeah. I don't know yes. if this is buckleberry. We know where to buy them now, don't we? That is Buckleberry from uh, uh, Brookside. Is it? Thank yeah. you. Good, good. This is John's Restrepia Gucciolata, <clears throat> which he got for, uh, as a keiki from Tiny Jungle, and he grows it outdoors on his balcony. This little treasure hails from Colombia, Ecuador, Venezuela, and elevations up to about 9,000 feet. So that tells us it's a cool grower. Some collections have been found as high as 14,000 feet. So it's a cool grower and a great candidate for outgrow, outdoor growing here in the Bay Area. Shaded or dappled light. It blooms off and on all year with flowers that are about two and a half inches wide by about four inches long. It's a really rewarding little orchid. It's like a big bug. John says this plant is labeled Lelia finkeniana, Santa Barbara HCCAOS, but he was skeptical about the name. I did some research and found that there was an HCC AOS awarded in 1999 to Santa Barbara Orchid Estates, Lelia Finkeniana. And the award photo is shown to the left of John's current photo. Finkeniana is a natural or primary hybrid of Anceps by Albida. So the flower and lip shape are quite reminiscent of both parents. With this parentage, John is successfully growing it outdoors on his balcony. Looks like Finkeniana. Say again. That's well, that's what it looks like. That's, it is that's yours. It's I got it via Dean Haas, but it's it's okay. The tag is yeah. certainly that's your, oh, was yours, yeah. Bill? Yeah. Was it yeah. yours, Bill? It's his yeah. tag for sure. <laughs> <laughs> this is Carolyn Fisher's Zygopetalum Blue Blazes Barry Ford. Carolyn is known to love all things purple, so she has a collection of zygopetalums which fit the bill for her. This one's been blooming for her since October. Many zygo flowers are cupped, but this one's quite flat and there's little windowing between the sepals and petals, so it's a nice flower shape. And I'm sure it's fragrant. Zygos can be grown in quite cool conditions. In fact, they bloom best with some cool nights to initiate flowering. So if you can protect it outdoors, this is also a Bay Area outdoor candidate. I grow all my zygos outdoors. Do you? Yep. The leaves look so good. This is Carolyn's Lely Ansep Bulls, which she grows outdoors in Southern Marin. 
It's the earliest recorded album form of anseps, and it's still one of the loveliest in my view. It's a robust plant which you can divide easily because the rhizomes creep over the edge of the pot, but it's not a huge or a tall anseps, so it's, it's more manageable and it's one of my favorites. This is Carolyn's small cymbidium, no ID. She says the spike has 20 flowers and at the right is a close up of the flower after yesterday's rain. The flowers are an inch and a half by two and a half with a really outstanding lip. Those look like little um, hieroglyphic markings to me. This is another of Carolyn's cymbidium no ID hybrids, which she grows outdoors. And it looks like it gets pretty much full rain. I don't, it looks like full sky above, although it's probably under a tree for some shelter. Again, an interesting red speckled lip with two distinct yellow, yellow keels or ridges to attract the, the pollinator to come hither. If you want they bloom and grow better, protect it from the rain because cymbidium doesn't like to be wet in this winter. Right. I grow a hundred cymbidiums outside. Most of them are not protected and they seem to yeah. do fine for me. Good. Mine aren't either. Whatever works, right? That's it. John McCallan shows us his Fragmopedium Peru Flora Spirit. And he says, this is his nicest frag. We've seen some pretty spectacular frags from John's collection over the past few months, but this one is really special. The petals are um, very full and they're, held, they're well held horizontally. Sometimes they droop, but these are well held horizontally. And uh, John didn't send the measurements on this, but I'm sure it's a big one. And it's a sequential bloomer, so more to come. John has two Lelia species in this photo, a Furfuracea on the left and a Kennedyi on the right. He says the flowers are similar, but the plants are very different. Kennedyi is much larger. J. Fowles orchid species encyclopedia indicates that Kennedyi is from the Mexican state of Jalisco and that it blooms successively on a single flowered inflorescence. However, Kennedyi has not yet been formally described, so he awaits a better reference on it. We saw Lelia furfuracea earlier, and it's from the Oaxaca state of southern Mexico. It's the coldest growing of the Mexican Lelias, and it requires a real dormancy to be successful. John shows us a very interesting new, still unregistered hybrid. This is Saphronitis cernua, crossed with Lelia anseps, which he purchased from Peter Lynn at an SFOS meeting last year, and this is a first blooming. Earlier, we saw Earl Rathbun's brilliant orange miniature Cernua has about a one inch flower. And we saw Susan's uh, big, beautiful anseps. So this is what you get when Earl and Susan get it together. <laughs> um, I'm sure the Cernua has brought down the plant size and the hybrid and the lip of the combined parents is, is really beautiful. We'll look forward to seeing more of this hybrid, hybrid from Peter Lynn. Is the sprite in the middle of the uh, sepal is uh, showing something? The stripe in the sep the dorsal? Yeah. Yeah, it's just, um, it's a little, just a kind of color break, I think, right along the, um, the vein there in the flower. The other flower doesn't show the white, the white uh, break. It shows more some magenta striping in there. You might test it now. Jason Gebbia is another new member, yay. And he's joining us from Maryland. Um, Jason, have you stayed on this long? It's, it's after midnight for him. He shows us this Fragmopedium West Pecos. This is a fairly complex little frag, but with all of its ancestry put together, it's about nine parts Frag Schlimii and one part Bessii, both of which grow in areas with constant water seepage. So. This is one orchid that does like wet feet. And I asked Jason how he grows his frags. This is his setup. He says, I grow in flood tables under lights for most. I run fans 24 seven to keep the air moving. A couple of my larger plants get their own lights and humidity reservoirs. On the left, uh, the tall one is his Fort Anne Bell Royal. Jason, are you online with us? If any, wants to, anybody wants to ask about your setup? Mm. No, Jason. All right. I know somebody is Sarah um, 
can she grow everything in the basement with the light set up is beautiful like especially like harbor area but these, i will uh, share they, some posts yeah i think these flood tables are kind of unique yeah. uh, so now that we've seen J how jason grows his frags here's his fragmapedium fisheri which i believe is named after jason fisher who owns orchid limited orchids limited in minnesota another great source for online shopping Frag fisheye is found in Ecuador at elevations of uh, 1,000 to 1,500 meters. It's a small, cool growing terrestrial. And this wonderful little fuzzy flower is about two inches. Beautiful. And this is Jason's Paphiopetalum FC puddle, the beautifully grown plant to have two full flowers like this, which are about four inches wide. From what I can see in the award data, they have, um, they're about four inches. This one has a slight pink blush and it's faintly peppered with brown spots. Very pretty. Kay Klum shows us this Shonorchis juncifolia, a long monopodial epiphyte from Borneo. So the roots are just at the base of the plant, which in the right-hand photo is up at the very top on the mount. Those are the roots up there. And the stem coming down from it is freely branching. It has um, terete leaves and tiny quarter-inch flowers, which are white and lavender, as we see on the left. They remind me of lilacs. Judy Carney received a CCE for cultural excellence uh, in 2013 here at PAC Central's judging. And Kay pointed out that if you Google show Norcus Josephalia, Ron Parsons' picture of Judy with her plant comes up. <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> Kay is, uh, Kay's is grown in a cool greenhouse. Kay shows us Bulbophyllum odoratissimum, which grows in a cool greenhouse for her. It's widespread in the Himalaya region at elevations up to 7,500 feet. The close up on the right shows that it's actually a cluster or an umbel of, of flowers at the apex of the inflorescence. I've read that it is, quote, pleasantly fragrant. So the name odor in the name should, should not be off putting here. <laughs> this is Kay's Selogeny. Monolorachis has a very interesting, bumpy, almost zigzag inflorescence or, or rachis, which continues to lengthen as new flowers are produced at the tip of the spike as older flowers fade. This is a species from Borneo, which we don't often see in cultivation. This has grown intermediate. I think the flowers are just lovely. They're translucent, light salmon with the bright orange side lobes and uh, the orange stripe across the midlobe of the lip. Very, Very interesting. Nice. Yeah. It's unusual. Kay got this Maxillaria shunkiana in Brazil, where it is native to the coastal mountains. As Kay says, it has lots of little purple black one inch flowers, but you have to look for them. They're all right around the base of that, of those pseudobulbs. Um, hers is mounted, so you can see them peeping out at the base of the plant. Mine is in a pot, which makes it even harder to notice the flowers. In fact, I think I need to look at it and see if it's secretly blooming on my bench. Mm -hmm. These grow best in intermediate conditions in medium to low light. So this would also be a good window cell candidate. Bill Weaver shows us his BLC Mishima Duchess Bloom and Insel by Lely Anceps Princess. This is a lovely hybrid with great shape and an even better lip. It's an unregistered hybrid with complex parentage as we can see in the uh, the pie chart to the right, 50% anceps, anceps. Bill shows us his Rincolalia digbiana, a fantastically fringed species from the hot, humid lowlands of southeastern Mexico and Yucatan. It's been used extensively in breeding with over 400 progeny, all seeking to pass on that, that fringe. So it's best grown warm and very bright light to bloom it well. Do you just love that flower? Ron Parsons would be raving. He loves fringe. It's also got an AM. It has a lot of awards, yeah. Yeah, Mrs. Chase got an AM also. So Bill shows us his Brassocatlia amethyst, which is across a cross of very unlikely partners. The small wispy Brassavola coccolata, which you see on the left, crossed with a robust and very frilly, huge Lelia purpurata. And I think the results here are spectacular. The hybrid was registered in 1980, uh, but it's never been awarded. I think maybe it's seen as something of a, a novelty hybrid, but this is one I'd love to have in my collection. So Bill, if you 
decide to divide it, I would love to purchase a piece. This is very cool. Bill does have an eclectic collection, doesn't he? This is Mormodi's Nitty Gritty SVO Ripper by Mormodi's Exotic Treat Orange Leopard. Mormodi's is a genus of 81 species from uh, Mexico to Brazil, and it's related to Catacetum, which can also be crossed with Mormodi's to create some very exotic and interesting flowers. Bill's plant is, uh, has produced a beautiful display here with another inflorescence underneath the, the foliage in the center of the picture. Fred Clark, Fred Clark actually registered this hybrid in 2017, and the hybrid is called Mormodi's Gareth Wills. You may want to change your tag on that, Bill. This is fabulous. Winnie Wang shows us her Dendrobium Cobber Violet Glow by Dendrobium Donokela, Toyet AMAOS. This is an unregistered, can't be unregistered. Oh yeah, the hybrid is unregistered with a number of Australian species in his parentage, including the huge speciosum, kingianum, and tetragonum. Winnie says this is in a five inch pot and the flower has a very pleasant fragrance for her in the morning but each flower doesn't last more than a week. Winnie with the um, Australian dendrobiums, not watering while they're flowering will make the flowers last longer. Winnie shows us her Potanara Young Men Orange Golden Satisfaction, which has an AM AOS. This is a very special hybrid with an AM from AOS, but the first award to Golden Satisfaction was in Taiwan in 2009, where it received a Grand Champion Award from the Taiwan Orchid Growers Association, or TOGA. This is a lovely orchid to have in your collection, Winnie. We have some of that. You what? We have some of these for sale, young mint okay. orange, yeah. This is Winnie's Oncidium hybrid with uh, favorite little yellow dancing ladies as they're called. She says it's in a four inch pot and it's easy to grow, a good windowsill orchid. And this is Winnie's Wilsonara Gay Spice Electric Orange. It's in a four inch pot and Winnie says there are not many leaves because she just divided it and repotted it last spring. So she's surprised that there are as many flowers as there are here. It reminds Winnie of firecrackers for the new year. It's nice. nice. Angelic Nguyen shows us her Dendrobium Gillingston Jazz by Tosca Starburst, another beautiful Australian complex hybrid with parentage including Kingianum, Tetragonum, Flecari, and Speciosum. And that deep magenta color is really unique and beautiful. Angelic shows us her Dendrobium tobaense, named for a town in Sumatra, where it's found in montane forests up to about 1,500 feet. The contrasting colors, the distinct red keels or, or ridges on the inside the lip, and the unique white tongue at the base of the lip make this a really unique Dendrobium. Tom Perlidi showed it at POE in 2018, where it was awarded an AM AOS, and I think it also won Best in Show that year. We all went gaga over it and bought divisions when Tom made them available. <clears throat> Mine died this year, so they are a bit fussy, but yours is it's a little warm growing. It's a really warm growing, and keep it moist, not, not dry winter. You're doing great with it. It looks beautiful. Thanks. This is Angelic Cymbidium tracianum. This is an important sim species discovered in 1890. It's a large size, cool growing epiphyte up to 6,500 feet found in Thailand and China. The flowers are about four to five inches wide with very distinctive stripes and spots and ruffles and fringes in the lip. So it's got it all. Tracianum has been used extensively in breeding over in over 10,000 progeny because of its vigor, um, its coloration and its strong substance. So. This is also, of course, a great outdoor grower in the Bay Area. And lastly, Angelic shows us her Vanda Cerulea Pink by Bits' Heartthrob. The deep raspberry color and the spotting and tessellation on the sepals and petals are really beautiful. It needs bright light and is happiest up near the green of the roof of the greenhouse. It's a large plant and is rewarding Angelic with two spikes this year. The flower about five and a half inch large. That's big. They're beautiful. Yeah. So for our pet photo of the month, since nobody else sent me one, I went into the greenhouse about nine o'clock one morning and I spotted this guy sound asleep on one of my lalias. <laughs> I, was afraid I'd, I was afraid I'd wake him up when I tiptoed over with my cell phone, but he was oblivious. 
So I gently peeled back and removed an ugly brown sheath that was right below him. He didn't move. Um, he still didn't wake up. You can see his little fingers, if that's what, what bees have, hooked over the, the edge of the, the lalia petal. He slept there for about another hour or so while I worked around him. And uh, finally, he buzzed off and looked looking for breakfast. So please send me your um, orchid animal photos for next month. Thank you. And happy new year, finally. Thank you. Lynn. Good job, Lynn. You're welcome. Good job, Lynn. Great job. Thank Great you. Job. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for all the culture. Yeah. I actually, I, I also got a Tracy Annum from Angelique and uh, Joe and I have been arguing over what it smells. It smells like peach pie to me in the house. <laughs> he thinks it smells like cardamom or something spicy. But. <laughs> I love the smell. It's, I think it smells like tea. <laughs> so, Sweet tea. It's very subjective, I guess. All right. Well, I know it's late and we still have a good crowd hanging on for the raffle, I think. So um, let me get this moving. So oh, I forgot one of the announcements. I have the Luna New Year sale or open house. I don't, I'm not sure yet, but I will start it for the um, beginning of the month, February. So I will um, post it um, on Facebook and newsletter. So if somebody want to come, welcome, and please give me a call and make an appointment. Okay. It will be a lot of blooming plan. So what I'm gonna do is um, for the raffle, I made a list of all the attendees here alphabetically, um, recognizing that several people have left. So, um, and I'm gonna use an automatic, I mean, not automatic, what is it called, a random, number generator like we did before to pick 10 names. So we'll try this out. I couldn't find the one I had before. So let's let's do this. So 74. Okay. I'm trying to show you what I'm doing because so then people can see it. Um, uh, all right. Can you see it? I think you can. So we want numbers between one and 74, and we want 10 of them. And what do we get? So the numbers are here. Numbers 5, 9, 10, 17, da, 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 da. So the winners on the list are Ernie Catler. Um, let's see. Actually, I have to make sure people are still here. So hold on a second. I don't have enough fingers to do this. Uh, one second. Um, all right, I'm gonna write those down. <laughs> Five, nine, ten, seven. Just copy it. I am. All right, that's going away. And now we'll go down the list and see who's here. Okay, so um, okay, so number five was Ernie. Number nine was Angelique Fry. Is she still here? No. Maybe she go to bed already. <laughs> Barbara, Barbara Makeham, you're here, right? Okay, you're a winner. Yay. Hey. Um, Next one, 17. Corey, are you still here? I'm still here. Okay, you're a winner. Um, Do you have to present? Oh. Who? Do you have to present to win? <laughs> no, no. Oh, you mean you need to be here, present? No. Yeah, yeah, because there's lots of people hanging out for the raffle, so. Um, Is this for show and tell first? So what now? No, no, this no, 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 we're just doing a, Lynn would win all the time. So uh -huh. <laughs> oh. okay. we're, we're doing the best we can here. Let's see. So okay. 10, 17. Who are we at? Oh, 26. Um, sorry, guys, bear with me here. Florence, Florence, you still here? 
Yep, yes. she's still here. Okay, you're oh, good. Um, it's supposed to be easier, but let's see here. <laughs> Lots of flipping back and forth. 26, 27. Um, Yeah. Larry, Larry Roberts. Larry, are you still here? Uh, I'm still here. I am. Yes. Thank okay. you. All Appreciate right. Um, okay. Tyler, are you still on? I'm deep. Okay. Jeff, uh, there's too many Jeffs. Jeff Doney. Jeff's actually a <laughs> member. So, yes. You're here. I'm here. Yeah. All right. Great. Earl Winner. Awesome. So, all right. Great. Um, <laughs> let's see here. We got Bill. Bill Weaver. All right, Bill. If he needed. And... Yep, he's still here. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, I need that like a hole in the head. Oh, <laughs> the plant? Yeah, I like them. Okay. John I need Williams. A photo background. John William, you're still on? Let's see. I thought I heard him. I said, and one thing that I'll After all the plants Bill and I got <laughs> this past weekend, we need, like, we need a new plant. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think. Oh, and then Beth, Beth McDonald, are you still on? Wait, wait. That's yep, hi. Yep. That's, yes. All right, that's. I think hi. that's it. All right, thanks everyone. And uh, next hey. month we're gonna have a uh, talk on barcarias. And, right. and I think Peter Lynn may be coming in March. So. Oh wow! Great. Yeah. And, uh, and from, we have a talk from China uh, from um, Wen Ching. From Wen Ching in April. So that's what we know so far. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.